All right, good morning again, everyone. Uh, we are about to get started. Um, please remain muted unless you are presenting, unless the, the speakers open up for questions. Uh, we wanna thank you again um, for joining our meeting. I am going, my name is Karen Lee. I am a program aide here at the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff. I am now about to turn everything over to Dr. English. Dr. English is the director of the Small Farm, Pro Small Farm Program here at the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff. Uh, he will be a moderator as well for this event. So Dr. English, I am turning it over to you again. Uh, we will mute you if you uh, do not meet yourself and we hear uh, interference from the, for the speakers to be able to present. I uh, don't want to uh, be rude, but we will do that. So please stay muted unless it's an open question and answer section. Dr. English. Well, thank you, Karen. Okay. Again, uh, welcome to this uh, hemp production workshop. Uh, and as we know, hemp is uh, relatively new in, in Arkansas, I guess, and across the nation. So there are a lot of questions about hemp. And unfortunately, there's not a lot of information available. Since it's, uh, I guess it's been legal for about two years, we don't have a lot of research to back up, you know, varieties, uh, uh, varieties and, uh, you know, and other information. So that's why we're bringing you this, this, this hemp production uh, workshop. And there, there are also a lot of questions about, you know, about growing it, the license and et cetera. And that's why we have uh, Caleb Allen, I guess, from the Arkansas Department of Agriculture to answer some of those questions. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Caleb Allen at the Arkansas Department of Agriculture. He's the Industrial Hemp Program Manager. Caleb. Uh, thank you, Dr. English. Uh, hopefully everybody can hear me. Uh, I think I got my Zoom working right. Um, my name is Caleb Allen. I'm the Hemp Program Manager at the Arkansas Department of Agriculture. Um, and like Dr. English just said, uh, hemp is very new, uh, not only to the United States, but it's also new uh, to farmers here in Arkansas. Uh, so 2020, we just wrapped up our second season of the Hemp Research Licensing Program. Um, and if I can get my screen to share, let's see here. All right, I think I'm sharing my screen. So here's some uh, end of year 2020 statistics. Uh, for the 2020 season, we licensed 121 growers, uh, 38 processor handlers, um, and really the differences between those two licenses uh, here at the Department of Ag is growers, of course, are producing hemp, so actually growing the crop, and then the processor handlers are the ones actually accepting the crop uh, to turn into a publicly marketable hemp product. Uh, for example, like your CBD oil. Um, basically means it's no longer in raw form uh, and can be sold uh, to the public consumer. Um, but you'll also see in 2020, we licensed just over 2,000 acres of outdoor field production across almost 210 field plots. Um, we licensed 126 greenhouses across just over 300,000 square feet. Um, and the thing about the greenhouses we're kind of seeing in the program is most growers will start out in the greenhouse and then transplant into the field. Um, I think it's a little costly to do the year round greenhouse production at this point in time. Um, but in 2020, and some of these numbers we're still kind of calculating on end of year reports. Um, so just over 730 acres uh, were planted, but of that 730 acres, only about 535 acres were actually harvested um, and considered compliant from THC testing. Um, so as you can see, we license a lot of acres uh, not as many get planted and not nearly as many get harvested. Um, there's still a lot of room to learn here. Um, as you can see, just from the way these numbers go down, uh, growers are still learning what to do with this crop, uh, best production practices. Uh, and then there's always the chance that you 
do go over on THC content. And that's what this almost nine acres represents um, is approximately nine acres of hemp that went above the legal limit of 0.3% THC and had to be destroyed uh, for program compliance. And I'll talk about that a little bit more here in a minute. Um, but we do have all the licensees wrapped up for 2020. Uh, we're still waiting on some end of year reports to come in. Uh, the most popular type of hemp production in Arkansas is floral hemp production at about 90%. Uh, with seed and fiber falling close behind at about five and five. Um, I'll now talk about the Agriculture Department website. Um, so really, because of the newness of this research licensing program, uh, all of the program tools can be found on the program website. So if you go to the home screen of the Ag Department, and you scroll down, doo -doo -doo, you'll see this little hemp button. This hemp home screen website is the number one best resource uh, for hemp growing in Arkansas. Uh, every single piece of information you could ever want or need uh, can be found on this web page. And it's across several different tabs, and apologies, they're not kind of indicated more separately. We just got a new website, so we're kind of uh, tweaking it as we go. But you'll see we have like a general overview of the program, uh, the rules and the laws, the application process. Um, if you are approved for licensure in the program, this license holders tab, number one best resource. And I'll just kind of go in here real quick. Um, so once you're approved, you'll see there's kind of uh, there's some program fees that we have to deal with, and I'll talk more about that here in a minute. Um, okay. Can I yes, sir. For a minute? Yes, sir. Okay. We still see the hemp research licensing program slide. Are you are you referring to uh, a web page or something like see. that? Yes, sir. Okay. Sorry. We, we, yeah, we do not see that. How about now? <laughs> Oh, yes. Now, now I see it. Now, okay, let me thanks. zoom back. Sorry, I'm still trying to figure out the zoom and the screen sharing stuff. So, okay, this is the Ag Department home web page. Um, okay. if, if you scroll down here, and it's just agriculture.arkansas.gov, uh, and you can Google that as well. But if you scroll down the website, you'll see this hemp button. And this is the website I was talking about that has um, every piece of information uh, surrounding the program that you could ever possibly need. Um, and it's across these different program tabs. So we have like the, you see the fees graph here. Um, and at the very bottom of this page is where you will find all of the program paperwork. And you can see there's a lot of information to cover here. Um, but this is where all the licensee forms are found, um, as well as uh, request forms, reporting forms, all that fun stuff uh, can be found on the bottom of most of these web pages. Um, but another thing Dr. English mentioned uh, was about varieties, and we did just publish a summary of varieties list uh, for 2021. And this is again on the license holders. Uh, website page. So if you click into this varieties list, the department has been accumulating uh, THC data for each variety grown in Arkansas. Um, but let's start at the beginning. Uh, we got to get a license first. Um, so you want to grow or process hemp in Arkansas, you need a license from the Department of Agriculture. Um, and we do have a few application deadlines to join the hemp program. Uh, generally, processor handler applications are gonna be accepted year round. Uh, growers, however, uh, we need, we have a deadline at the end of April for new growers, uh, just because you, you kinda need to have your operations uh, set up, planned out, kind of have a business model figured out by the time you get the license. 
um, I saw a lot of people really fighting for the license. And then once they got it, they weren't prepared. They couldn't get their planning uh, stock material in in time. They couldn't plant quick enough, um, so on. So that's kind of why we have a grower deadline early in the season uh, to help prevent some of those headaches for new growers. Um, so on this application uh, web page, I talk about the deadlines some more. Then these two documents right here are probably your best uh, resources for the application process. Um, as you can see, this is an application instructions packet. Um, so it's just very general. How do I pay? How much do I pay? Who pays what? Um, what is fiscal year licensing? That's a question we get a lot. Uh, most people would think the license is on the calendar year, um, but it actually begins uh, July 1st through June 30th annually. So anyway, this instructions packet has a lot of useful information. Uh, the program is very email use heavy, um, especially with COVID. Uh, happening in the nation. A lot of post mail is delayed here at the department. Uh, most mail doesn't come directly to my desk. So your best bet when working with this program really is the email uh, communication use. Um, and we do have a very general email address right there that anybody can submit questions to, turn in your uh, program reporting forms, uh, stuff like that. And we have a nice chart to explain what paperwork is due for who and when. Um, this is a very paperwork heavy program. Uh, it's just the nature of the beast. Um, you wanna grow hemp, there's quite a bit of paperwork involved. Uh, and we're here to help you with that paperwork if, you're, if you have any questions about it. Point. Um, uh, I would really start here. So anyone that was interested in this program, that was interested in growing hemp in Arkansas or processing, handling hemp in Arkansas, I would start with this massive uh, 105 slide PowerPoint. And I know that's a lot of slides, um, but there's a lot of information around this program and it's best to get everyone on the same page. And we figured this was the best way to get the voluminous information out is with this gigantic PowerPoint. So I don't know if you want to print these out and sit on the couch one night and just kind of do uh, four slides a night or, or whatever, but there is so much useful information in here. Uh, start here, please, before you start considering applying for the program. Um, talk about all kinds of stuff from program to crop production, background checks. Um, if you have any general questions about hemp, I promise it is addressed somewhere in this PowerPoint. Um, we talk about how we got to where we are. Uh, so the Arkansas Industrial Hemp Act of 2017 passed, creating this research program under the 2014 Farm Bill. Um, and for this season, and I know I'm going a little fast, sorry, um, under the 2018 Farm Bill, which was passed in December 2018, uh, we've decided to extend the research program for the 2021 season. Our hemp production plan to the USDA for approval under the USDA interim final rule, which means we will be a commercialized program under the 2018 Farm Bill. Now I know that was kind of confusing, but since this program is a 14 farm bill program, we are a research program. All license holders are conducting research. Until we, we are approved under the USDA interim final rule, uh, we will have that research plan requirement until we move to commercialization. Um, and then I talk about just some of the general, like the definition of hemp, uh, which if you haven't, uh, 
if I haven't mentioned it by now, is cannabis sativa with a dry weight concentration of delta, uh, delta 9 THC of not more than 0.3%. Um, so we're talking about teeny tiny amounts of psychoactive THC. Um, at this time, the only food ingredients that are acceptable for hemp are your hemp seed oil products. Uh, so hemp seed protein powder and non-viable hold hemp seed. Um, and you can find hemp, edible hemp seed on your store shelf at Kroger or whatnot. So what does each license permit you to do? Um, with a processor handler license, no live plants, um, that is covered under a grower license. Um, so it's really grower license, you're growing uh, live plants, you can store your harvest um, and market your own crop to other grower license holders or processor handler license holders. Um, hemp, raw hemp, can only flow from licensee to licensee restrictions on sale or transfer. Um, and that's a whole other rabbit hole we could go down. Um, the information's there. I really recommend going and reading it before uh, developing any marketing plans. Alrighty. Let's see if I talked about everything else up here. You can see there's just so much information about this program. Um, again, we use email all the time. Uh, we're much quicker with email than we are on the phone. Uh, that's just with the nature of a new program. Uh, a lot of program paperwork is also submitted through email. Um, and I promise you submitting that paperwork through email will ensure the timely handling of your inspections. Uh, for example, there's a 15 day harvest rule. So, and you can't just harvest whenever you want, you have to request to harvest 15 days before you want to harvest. Um, we do have license uh, lists on the website as well as a list of Arkansas hemp seed dealers. Um, so if you want to deal viable hemp seed for planting in Arkansas, you need an Arkansas seed dealer license. And that license is managed through the pro, uh, seed sections program. Uh, and they have a list on their website. Um, any hemp crop consultants in Arkansas need a crop consultant license from the department. Uh, can visit that link for more information there. Um, there are some other requirements for bringing seedlings, uh, hemp seedlings into the state, uh, whether that's a nursery license or a phytosanitary license, uh, just kind of depends on the situation. And we'd be more than happy to help you with that once that time comes. These two attachments right here, if you use both of them to try to wrap your brain around this program in the state, um, that will really help you through the application process um, and will answer many, if not all, um, of your questions. Um, last thing I'll kind of talk about as far as applications are concerned is this making aerial location ID maps help. So every single license holder and the program has to submit an aerial map uh, similar to this. Uh, and you have to show your outdoor fields, like with the outline, just like these two. And then you also have to show your greenhouses, whether those are individual uh, covered structures or buildings or um, in storage locations. And it's all mapped out through GPS coordinates, uh, six digit, GPS coordinates. and we kind of have this little graph to explain what needs to be registered as a location ID and what does not. So like in this case, this would be two location IDs because there's trees blocking each field. So one field location ID and another field location ID. Um, and so anything blocking the fields, two separate location IDs, 
uh, more than 20 feet away from one another, that's two different location IDs. Um, and of course, one for each individual building. But other than that, um, just re referring to this application process, uh, applications for hemp licensing tab, uh, will answer so many of your questions. You will find both applications posted there, um, as well as just some other general information about fees uh, and other, I wanna grow hemp, where do I start? Uh, lots of fun stuff on here. It is information overload. So my apologies, but that's why we're here to help y'all as much as we possibly can. Um, and I know that was kind of fast and furious. I can answer any uh, questions anybody might have. Uh, thank you, Caleb. Do we have questions for Caleb? Yeah, Caleb, I just want to state uh, your presentation was a little choppy on and off um, for several people, um, including myself. Um, um, I'm not sure if that was the case for Dr. English or not because he, yeah. didn't, because he didn't say anything. Yeah. But um, so I just have a question: Is a, a lot of the information you said is covered in the uh, on the website, right? Yes, ma'am. Um, yeah, and my apologies for that. I kept seeing a poor quality notification come up. I don't know if it's my internet here, um, but yes, all that information is found on the hemp home website and i can put that link in the chat box um thank you yeah. yes yeah my apologies i wish it was a little smoother here it's okay it's storming i said i understand that weather the weather has to like you know has the final say so yeah. um, could and you also I'll, put your email address in there as well, just in case someone has questions for you? Yes, ma'am. Um, and then I'll, I was also going to mention, I have plans to record a webinar of me going over the grower orientation PowerPoint. Uh, and maybe once we get that video finalized, we can post it on the website and that'll be a little easier uh, for everybody to follow. Thank you so much, so much. Um, okay, well, someone sent me a question um, in reference to the um, harvesting. Um, you said that you have 15 days to request harvesting before you harvest, or could you go over that part because you were um, going in and out during that time? Sure. Um, so I think I was talking about the program's email use. Um, so a lot of hemp production in this program is time sensitive. So you can't just harvest whenever you want. We as a department, we have to come back out and pull a compliance sample. So let's say you want to harvest on January 15th. Uh, 15 days before that January 15th, so January 1, you need to submit a harvest request form, which will then trigger the department to send an inspector out to come collect a sample. Um, so my point was a lot of this is time sensitive and that's why email use is uh, for your own benefit because if you send it in the mail, we may not get it until several weeks later. Yeah, and Caleb, I had one question. I think in your report, you submitted, you indicated something about an end of the year report that mm -hmm. farmers had to do. Could you comment a little bit about that? Yeah, so at the end of the season, licensees will turn in a production report. And that's just to basically tell the department here's what I planted, here's how much I harvested, here's what I grew for, here's uh, the yield, crop yield amount, uh, and we collect all these statistics as part of the research program uh, to show Arkansans 
may be interested in this industry, hey, here's the numbers. Uh, you might want to consider these numbers before becoming involved in this industry. Uh, so for example, for the 2020 season, we're still kind of accumulating some of those numbers, but a large majority of hemp growers experienced uh, over 90%. So that's the kind of information that we accumulate from the growers to share with the industry. Thank you. Okay, Caleb, I have another question. Um, what if you don't harvest all of your plants? Yeah, so um, that's, when I, when I hear that question, the first thought that comes to mind is when we come back out to pull a sample, it's $100 per sample for your harvest into two. Let's say you planted an acre plot. Um, you harvest half that acre, that's a hundred dollars. And then you harvest it. Then you have to request again to harvest the remaining half acre. And that's another hundred dollars uh, because we have to collect the THC testing. So that's my only fear is uh, you, you can stagger your harvest that way, but it's gonna cost you a hundred dollars each time. Is there a certain time where you have to have your field clear? Um, no, ma'am. Uh, that's really up to the grower uh, turning in that harvest request form. Okay. So then it is okay if I don't harvest to just leave it in, um, uh, I guess, um, turn it over in the field? Yeah, I like to see... Um, if you're growing hemp, it can either be harvested or destroyed. Um, so we can't really just leave it there forever. It's gonna have to be harvested or destroyed at some point. Um, but if that was a grower's research project is, I wanna plant this and I'm just gonna leave it for over a year just to see what happens, um, that's something we could entertain in a research plan. Okay, Caleb, here's one question that's in the chat box. It says, where can we find a list of processors by region? Mm -hmm. So on the website, the program website, let me see. I feel bad my presentation was choppy for y'all. Hopefully I can get this to go. So on this uh, program overview tab, if you scroll down, there's a current hemp license holders list and you'll see growers, processors. I'm not sure. Okay, so we do have it listed by mailing. So we do have that kind of uh, location specific information on there. Okay. Uh, another question was, is it please comment on how agreements may be developed between processor and growers to help protect. Yeah, well, and that's a really important because most of the time I've seen in agriculture, it's usually the farmer getting the short end of the stick. Um, I, so as part of the application, there is a letter of intent requirement, which means you want to be a grower. We're not going to license you unless you have a letter of intent from a processor handler who's going to work with you on your operations. Um, but my best advice, um, I don't think hemp growers should be planting unless they have an end goal in mind with their processor. So uh, I, I, I just think growers need to think it all the way through you want to plant this, but what's your end goal? Who are you going to sell it to? How much like between you and the processor? Um, and iron out all those details before you even plant. Uh, I just hate seeing people uh, investing all their money into this uh, without really securing things on the front end. Okay. Okay, the next question. What's the status of the rule for producers to have storage space available at harvest time? 
it's going to be additional expense to the producer. Yeah, so we are requiring growers to register a storage site this season. Um, and that actually is a program requirement in the rules because what happens is you, so you request a harvest, we send an inspector out to collect the sample. As soon as the inspector collects the sample, the farmer has 15 days to completely harvest that plot. You're not, you may not get your test result back within that 15 day period, but you still have to harvest and you still need a place to store that harvest uh, pending the receipt of those test results. Um, so you can partner with uh, to store your harvest with you, uh, but that processor handler also needs to keep in mind that the plot could go hot and the plot could possibly need to be destroyed on site. Oh, thank you, thank you. Okay. We have another question. Are you able to, are you able to ensure the hemp crop? Yeah, so this is something new uh, to Arkansas. Um, USDA just announced a few uh, insurance risk management programs for our Arkansas hemp crop producers. I believe it's for specific Arkansas counties though. Um, but as Arkansas moves closer to commercialized USDA approved production, I can see more insurance uh, crop options coming on board for producers. Okay. The next question, what are the legal process of destroying the crop? Yeah, so USDA does spell out specific ways to destroy hemp. Um, and basically what the DEA says is it the crop has to be rendered non-retrievable. So whatever you do to it, you cannot retrieve it back in its, its original form. So that can be burning, incineration, uh, plowing, mulching. Uh, you can even do like a deep burial situation. And all of these scenarios are spelled out in our sampling and testing guidelines document. And that's on the website as well. Okay, the next question. The letter of intent will not stand its ground with lenders. They require a true contract to buy from processor buyer. Right, so the letter of intent requirement is really just an application requirement for the license in or anything like that is really between the grower and the processor and the department isn't really gonna have hands in that. That letter of intent requirement is part of the research program um, and so as we move toward a commercial program, I'm doing away with the letter of intent and then everything else is at the will of the industry and whatever contracts um, come up between grower and process. Uh, thank you, thank you, okay. And that's all the questions that I see in the chat box. Does anybody else have a question that they would like to ask If not, it appears that the website has quite a bit of information. It, too I'm much. Yes, <laughs> that, that my internet connection is unstable. But uh, if you go to that website, you can get just about <laughs> anything you need. It's, it's very thorough. I'll give you that. It, it covers mm -hmm. just about everything. Yeah, and I would my, really start with that grower orientation PowerPoint. Uh, mm -hmm. It's long, it's lengthy. I, I tried to put pictures in there for everybody. Um, but I would start there and just try to get a baseline knowledge of what you're considering. Yeah, I think that's an excellent plan. Like I said, the information that you have there is, is just great. It's just about anything that you want to have. And I can appreciate the variety of information that you have up there, you know, the up to date information. And yes, and we try to do uh, keep it as up to date as possible. And I am putting my email address in the chat for y'all. Okay, okay, okay. 
Are there any other questions? If not, I, I want to thank you, Caleb. One more question someone sent me. Um, okay. Caleb, with that letter of intent, if you choose to go, if something happens and you cannot use the um, processor, is it okay to go with a different one? I think that would be something that would be sorted out. It, whatever your contract says, you know, um, the letter of intent, is it legally binding? Is it not? Uh, that's between the grower and the processor. Really, to satisfy Arkansas's requirements, uh, it needs to flow from license holder to license holder, and that is a hemp license holder through a state's Department of Agriculture. Um, but that's me speaking without really knowing what contracts say. Because if you, if you signed an all-encompassing contract saying you can only sell to me, you probably shouldn't violate that contract. Um, but the letter of intent, it, it really is just an application requirement and any other agreements need to be between the grower and the processor. Okay. And here's another question that popped up in the chat box. I think it said, could I get a copy of that PowerPoint and all the information to my email? Yeah, um, I can put the link in the chat um, for the PowerPoint. Uh, it, it's easier to just go to the website and click the link, honestly. Okay. Let me put that here. Okay, so that's the PowerPoint. Okay. okay. And I think that answers the other question. Wait a minute, here's another question. Do you have examples of good grower processor contract? Okay, do you have an example of a good grower processor contract? Um, I don't have an example. Um, I would really think what I'm a grower, what does my processor want? Or what is their end goal and how can I help them meet that end goal? Um, but some of this too is this is not only new to the grower, it's also new to the processor and it's also new to the department. Like this is a new ball game. Um, and really, if someone's looking for a good example of a contract, uh, I would look for maybe a licensee in another state that has maybe uh, worked with hemp a little bit longer. Uh, for example, Kentucky, yeah. um, any state that's been in this ball game a little bit longer, maybe try to look for some network connections there. Thank you. Okay. okay. And again, apologies, my presentation was a little choppy. Um, hopefully I can get a webinar video worked out on the website for everybody. Yeah, yeah, and about that, we don't know that which end it was, which end was causing it. It could have been our end. It may end. have been me. <laughs> this this building. You don't ever know. <laughs> like yeah, I will never know. Okay. Thank you, Caleb, okay. Okay, so moving right along, next. Our next speaker is from Kentucky. You heard Caleb mention Kentucky. Kentucky has been in this business, I think, a little bit longer than some of the other states. Uh -huh. So that's why we went to uh, Kentucky. We tried to get somebody from Kentucky to come on and, you know, give us a presentation. And uh, with the uh, 1890 universities, we have this center of excellence, I guess, small farms. And one of the things that we're doing in that, you know, in that uh, center of excellence, is we're giving, uh, providing them information, education information on hemp production. And our lead institution is Kentucky State, Kentucky State University. That's why we have Dr. Lucas here, and he's from Kentucky State. We have been doing it a little bit longer than, you know, than, than most other states, you know, for that. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Lucas. He's gonna give us some information on production of hemp basis. Dr. Lucas. Thank you, Dr. English. I'm glad to be here and thank you, Karen uh, and Dr. English for inviting me to be part of your workshop today. Um, I was listening to Caleb uh, talk and, and you know, uh, the program that you all have in Arkansas sounds very similar uh, administratively to what uh, Kentucky Department of Ag sets up here. Um, so I'm fairly familiar with uh, 
the guidelines that you all follow. Um, we have been doing it a little bit longer here in Kentucky. Um, we were growing hemp in Kentucky in 2014, uh, as soon as the 2014 Farm Bill uh, was enacted. And uh, I personally have been involved with hemp since 2015. So uh, I've seen a lot with this crop over the last few years. And I'm, I'm going to share a little bit about our experiences in Kentucky, uh, tell you a little bit about the marketplace, uh, and give you some production basics and probably a few cautionary notes along the way. I'm gonna share my screen. Hopefully this, okay, and I probably gotta make this full screen, right? Can we all see that? Yes. Okay. So that field actually is not even in Kentucky. That field you're looking at in the picture here is a 400 acre field that was up in Indiana uh, in 2018. Really big operation. Uh, I think they made money on that field in 2018, but that company that ran that field did not make money in 2019. Uh, and we'll, we'll kind of hear, a, like I said, a few cautionary notes on this industry. A lot of what I'm going to talk about is grounded in organic principles, because I am the or, uh, assistant professor of organic agriculture at Kentucky State. Uh, I am also our hemp research program coordinator, uh, but I, most of the work that I do in hemp is very much to figure out how hemp best fits in organic systems. Uh, you can certify a hemp crop organic back uh, when we were under the research programs under the 2014 Farm Bill, people had questions about whether, you know, this is a controlled substance. Can you actually certify this organic or not? Well, the USDA came out uh, in late 2016 uh, with a guidance that said, yes, indeed, if you are operating a hemp production program uh, that is, you know, run by a state entity like Kentucky Department of Ag or Arkansas Department of Ag, uh, and you are certified organic, then you can uh, certify your hemp crop and the products that come out of that as organic. And here in Kentucky, uh, it's actually on our, uh, Kentucky Department of Agriculture is our primary organic certifier. Uh, and so it's actually on our application. Uh, if you want to be an organic grower in Kentucky, industrial hemp is on the organic certification application. You know, one of the reasons that we've been focusing on organic, uh, you know, hemp is one of these crops, especially if people are thinking about it uh, in terms of CBD extracts and, and cannabinoid extracts. Uh, people were thinking about those and you gotta be careful how you talk about it. You can't call it a medicine. You can't call it, uh, you know, uh, a therapeutic or anything like that. FDA has not approved these uh, products uh, or done any, you know, there is no FDA approval for cannabinoids yet. So, you, you know, people think of them as dietary or health supplements, but you got to be able to, you got to be careful how you talk about them. But since they are thinking about them from the perspective of, uh, you know, health or uh, benefits, a lot of people are interested in products that don't necessarily contain agrochemical residues. Uh, and so there is some interest in organic uh, hemp products. The reason that we're interested in helping farmers figure that out is because there's a big price premium on organic products in general. Uh, I have two boys and uh, they drink a lot of milk, uh, probably about a gallon of milk every two, two and a half days. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and I'm the organic guy at Kentucky State, right? So my boys drink organic milk. Well, organic milk costs about six bucks a gallon, but if you, <laughs> but if you go to, you know, your Walmart or your Kroger and you get conventional milk, it's about two bucks a gallon, right? Uh, and you can see that on this figure here in the top left that I have on this slide, uh, milk is about 72% higher price um, than the non-organic, organic milk is about 72% higher price than non-organic milk. Uh, and you could see a similar trend there with other products, right? Your vegetables are the, the, the percentage uh, isn't quite as high. Your carrots are 27, 28. Uh, 
82% higher. There's a grower here in Kentucky. He's a friend of mine. He charges seven dollars and twenty-five cents for a dozen eggs. I, I asked him how he gets re- how he could get away with that. He said, "Well, I've never had anybody return them and complain. So, uh, you know, I guess if you can capture the premium, uh, go for it." And so, you know, we're thinking maybe there's opportunity there for organic growers uh, with hemp as well. Um, and this figure on the bottom right. Uh, the red dotted line and the blue dotted line uh, represent organic corn. The blue is for human consumption. The red is for livestock. And on average, those are about uh, $12 a bushel, right? $12 to $14 a bushel. Uh, the green line represents non-organic. I don't like to use the word conventional because uh, so many different growers use so many different practices. It's not about organic and conventional. You know, there's certified or not certified. But if you're not certified organic, your corn... Uh, in between four and six dollars a bushel. Uh, that that, that date is a little dated, going back to about 2014, but the but trends are still pretty similar. Uh, this is a organic CBD product that we have uh, on the shelves at the grocery store around the corner from my house here in Lexington, Kentucky. Uh, KSU is in Frankfurt. I, I work in Frankfurt, live in Lexington, about a half hour drive over to Frankfurt. Uh, but this product is a certified organic CBD extract. Uh, the price on the shelf when I took the picture was uh, $59.99, and that was when it was on sale, normally $79.99. This was in June of 2019. Well, by um, November of 2019, those prices had gone down. Uh, but it was $45 for 30 milliliters of this product. Uh, and a similar product that is non-organic uh, was $41, but you get double the amount there, right? 60 milliliters. Uh, so you're, the, the, the idea of the price premium is, is, seems to be carrying over to these hemp products. So that's my little organic spiel. I was asked to talk about production. Uh, and so I'm gonna go through just some hemp biology basics, some of the production practices that we've used at Kentucky State. Uh, and then we'll go into a little bit about uh, what the market looks like. Uh, so, you know, hemp is cannabis. Cannabis, you know, is cannabis sativa. The difference between um, hemp and marijuana is, simply a matter of chemistry. I, I like to think of it like peppers. Uh, hot peppers have high levels of the chemical capsaicin, right? That's what makes you sweat and makes you need to run and get a glass of water as quick as you can. Uh, bell peppers, they're sweet, right? But they don't have the heat. So they're, they don't have high levels of capsaicin. Uh, now with cannabis, we have a legally uh, defined level of chemicals that uh, are acceptable. Uh, in particular, I'm talking about THC here. Uh, so as Caleb mentioned earlier, uh, according to the 2014 and 2018 farm bills, uh, hemp products are 0.3% THC or less. Anything above that is considered uh, a non-hemp cannabis uh, plant and is uh, illegal unless you're in one of the states where they've uh, uh, changed the rules on that. But uh, cannabis is a summer annual. Most varieties are photo period dependent, but increasingly there are some uh, what they call auto flower varieties that flower more like a corn plant. Um, photo period dependent means that hemp flowers kind of like soybean. It, it flowers according to the day length. The shorter the day length, uh, the plants are going to start. Uh, uh, we're looking at late July, early August is when we're starting to see just the very preliminary formation of flowers. Uh, hemp is kind of unique. It's got um, male and female flowers on separate plants, uh, usually, although there are some occasions where you will see male and female uh, flowers on the same plant. Those are hermaphrodites, and if you're growing for CBD, uh, you really got to watch out for those. Uh, this picture on the lower left are mature male flowers. And this picture on the upper right is a uh, maturing, not fully mature female flower. 
I did mention auto flowers in that previous slide. Auto flowers, like I said, uh, they are hemp varieties that flower not based on the amount of day length, but uh, by the amount of time they've spent in the field. They tend to be a little shorter and they tend to mature a little earlier than the photo period uh, dependent varieties. Um, you know, there's, a, I think Caleb mentioned this earlier, there are uh, sort of three primary reasons why people are growing hemp for fiber, uh, for grain, and for cannabinoids. Uh, these different production scopes sort of define how the plant looks. Uh, your fiber plants are tall and less branched. Uh, this picture on the left here is a uh, fiber crop uh, grown by David Williams at University of Kentucky a couple years back. Uh, this is my colleague at Kentucky State, Kevin Grotowski. Kevin's about five foot nine. So you can see uh, those plants are about 12 feet tall and there's not a whole lot of branching. You see some, but when I show you the, uh, the CBD variety here on the next side, you'll see, you'll see the difference between branching between a fiber crop and a, uh, and a CBD crop. Uh, your grain crops, they tend to be a little shorter, uh, three to four feet tall, a uh, little bit more uniform as far as where the uh, flower heads are. Uh, and, you know, a lot of these can be combined. Uh, and so this picture on the right is a... Uh, and here is a CBD variety. Uh, this is actually from our crop in 2018 at Kentucky State. Uh, and you can see those are a lot more branched. They almost look like little Christmas trees compared to, uh, you know, that fiber crop that was in the previous slide. Um, this is really indistinguishable from marijuana. The only reason, the only way you can tell if this is hemp or marijuana is to collect a sample uh, and have a laboratory analyze that sample and let you know what the uh, THC content is. So just a little bit of agronomics on hemp. People say you throw it in the field and it'll grow in any kind of soil and it'll, you know, you, know, you can throw the seeds on a rock and it'll grow and it doesn't require any fertilizer. That's not true. Uh, this is a crop and so it needs to be treated like a crop. It does respond to fertilizer. You know, 50 to 100 pounds per acre is what people had been recommending uh, for fiber and grain. My colleagues at uh, University of Kentucky have now bumped theirs up to about 120 to 150 pounds per acre of nitrogen uh, for whatever reason you're growing it for. Um, you know, the, the, it, it's, a, it's a, a plant that, you know, you give it the nitrogen, it's going to do what plants do when you give it nitrogen. Um, Seeding rate, you know, it depends on what we're doing with it. Um, fiber, that pretty heavy. You want a dense stand because you don't want branching. And if you have a lot of plants kind of crowded together in a field, um, you're going to encourage those plants to grow tall, uh, kind of reach up for the sun, if you will, and um, have long, straight stalks. And of course, with fiber, that's what we're after. We're after the stalks. That's where the fiber is. Um, so we plant those pretty heavy seeding rate, 60 pounds per acre on about a seven inch row spacing. Uh, grain people typically plant at a uh, lower seeding rate, 20 to 40 pounds per acre. And, and I actually will never plant grain at bigger than a seven inch row spacing as well. Um, some people do recommend that high and you see it on the slide, it says about 30 inches. Um, but right now with the lack of, um, products for use in weed control. Uh, and of course I'm organic, so I'm not really using products. I'm using labor uh, and, and uh, you know, uh, crop rotations and cover crops and uh, graduate students <laughs> to, to do my weeding. Uh, and so, uh, you know, anything above a seven inch row spacing really gives too much open space and those weeds will come on pretty quick. Uh, once the hemp's canopy gets established, then it smothers out the weeds pretty well. But uh, when they're in a young phase, you really need to have them packed tight together uh, so that they uh, can outcompete the weeds. Um, the planting depth, if you are direct seeding, um, 
we've really seen in Kentucky that anything below a quarter inch uh, planting depth and you're going to reduce the amount of seeds that germinate and you're actually, you know, giving those weeds a head start uh, because that, that seed, once it germinates, still needs to, uh, you know, get through that half inch or whatever you did uh, to get to the surface. And by the time it gets there, the weeds already have a head start. Um, so that, that quarter inch planting depth is really ideal. Um, you don't want to go any deeper than that if you're direct seeding. Uh, if you're growing cannabinoids, you know, you're most likely transplanting uh, greenhouse starts or clones. Uh, and so it's, it's a different ball game there. But for direct seeding, quarter inch planting depth. They don't like really hot soil. So, you're, you know, these seeds germinate best between 65 and 75 degrees Fahrenheit. Once you get up in the 80s and the soil gets warm, uh, they really, uh, when it still gets hot, they really start uh, seeing a reduction in germination. So, you know, for fiber and grain here in Kentucky uh, and probably Arkansas as well, um, mid-May, early June. But, uh, you know, once you start getting into the second or third week of June, you're really kind of going to start pushing it on that, that um, heat impact on germination. So, um, and remember, these are photo period sensitive. So the earlier you're able to get them in, the bigger they'll get. Uh, they'll flower at the same time, uh, no matter when you get them in, uh, because it depends on how long the days are. So, you know, you get past that summer solstice and the days start getting shorter, that biological uh, activity kicks in in the plants and they shift the flowering. So the bigger they are, the earlier you got them in, the, the, uh, the bigger your yields will be. This is what we use at KSU. This is a uh, actually a pasture planter, but it works great for our uh, hemp planting. Um, and we're able to just tease those coulters in um, and allow the seeds to drop in at about that uh, quarter inch depth. And, uh, you know, there are some more precise tools out there. Some people use uh, old tobacco seeders here, or actually not, some people here in Kentucky, since we were a hemp, state, uh, you know, in the 1800s and uh, early 1900s, uh, there are still a few old hemp planters around. I haven't personally had uh, heard a few rumors about them and they have settings on them that uh, um, really fine tune that, that uh, planting depth. Uh, but this planter works fine for us at KSU. Uh, this was our crop for fiber in 2017. Uh, so what it looked like on the left in July. And on the right, uh, that was August. You can see, uh, you know, this is vegetative growth. You don't see flowers uh, in the picture on the left because uh, these plants have not gone fully into flowering yet. But first, um, you could start seeing the flower heads there. This is not nitrogen deficient hemp, by the way. Uh, it looks a lot more yellow in the picture on the right. It's the same crop, but I took this on August 21st, 2017, uh, during the solar eclipse that we had here in Kentucky. So um, it was a great day to take some pictures on the farm, uh, a little bit different lighting. Uh, unfortunately, it made my crop look yellow, but it's not nitrogen deficient hemp. Um, Typically, uh, people mow and bale a hemp crop um, for fiber. And the real trick, if you're growing fiber, is to find a processor right now. There's not a lot of processors out there um, processing fiber. And, you know, this is big, bulky material when you mow it and bale it. And so, um, you know, finding a processor that's semi-close to home is, is pretty important. Uh, because if you uh, have to transport this stuff too far, it's going to eat into your margins. There, you know, there are some pieces of equipment that are coming out. Uh, I actually saw one of these at a hemp symposium out in Colorado a couple years back. Really massive machine. Uh, kind of looks uh, like it would tip over with these uh, big hoppers on the back of it. Um, but this purpose harvester. Uh, the top combine head harvests the flowers off and I think they do some CBD extraction uh, from the flowers and then they've got the bottom uh, head that cuts the stalks off and they're collecting the fiber out of that. 
Uh, these are pretty expensive. So I haven't actually seen one of these running in the field where I saw it, it was at a symposium. Um, pretty neat looking piece of equipment. Uh, probably your uh, average farmer that I'm serving, uh, you know, at Kentucky State, uh, under-resourced farmers probably aren't gonna be able to afford that uh, piece of equipment anytime soon. If you are growing for fiber, uh, you know, the goal is to get the fiber out of the stalk. Uh, and so the traditional way that people did that uh, was to allow the stalks to partially decompose in the field. That process is called redding. Um, and so uh, unlike in the previous slide that was going to uh, send the fiber material off to a processor immediately, and the processor does the redding process, uh, redding just simply means uh, separating the fiber from the stalk. And so this do redding is where you're redding the fiber in the field. It decomposes for eh, 20 to 30 days. Uh, and that allows for easier separation of the fiber from the stalk. You could see here in the picture uh, on the lower right, this outer part here is the bast fiber. And then the inner part here is the herd. Uh, people use the herd actually for things like animal bedding. Uh, but the fiber is in this peeling off uh, and that do redding process in the field actually softens the fibers up and uh, makes them a little easier to work with as far as a textile uh, from what I've heard from some of the people working on that side of the industry. For grain harvest, uh, let me back up a step. Can I go backwards? Nope, nope. Yeah, I can. I don't think I pointed out when to harvest. Um, I kind of glossed over that in this slide. So for, for fiber harvest, once the males start flowering, um, and males generally flower before females, once 20 to 30% of the males start flowering, people think about harvesting their fiber crops. Because at that point, the plants are going to put all of their energy into uh, producing flowers and seeds. And they're not going to get much taller. And remember, this is for a fiber crop. And so, you know, we, we're, we're interested in the stalks. If the stalks aren't going to get any bigger, then it makes sense to keep that plant in the field much longer. Male plants are flowering. That's when uh, you start seeing 20 to 30% of your male plants flowering. That's when you might think about harvesting your fiber crop. Your grain crop is a little trickier. This is not like corn and it's not like wheat, right? Uh, corn and wheat, the, the, the kernels stay on the ear. Uh, the wheat grains stay on that head of uh, wheat. Uh, hemp still shatters. It's more of a, a wild plant than corn or wheat. So by shatter, I mean, you know, hemp wants to drop its seeds and spread its seeds around. Um, if you don't believe me, walk through a hemp field the next year after someone has grown hemp in it the previous year, and you'll see plenty of uh, volunteers. Um, but the with hemp is you got to time it right. Um, about 70% grain maturity, uh, roughly when 30 to 40% of the little bracts that are coating the seed, the seed bracts, when they start turning brown, that's when it's a good idea to think about harvest. Um, and it's really finding a sweet spot. If you wait too long, uh, these plants are going to drop their seeds in the field and you're going to lose uh, a lot of what you were trying to get out of that field. Uh, if you come in too early, well, this is hemp. It's a fiber crop. Uh, it's a fibrous plant, but it's also a sticky plant. And so um, it can gum up the works of the machine if you're not careful. Uh, so it's all about finding the sweet spot once these seeds start ripening before they drop. So as far as production, you know, we talked about fiber and grain here. Um, your strategies are a little bit different for cannabinoids. Fiber and grain, we don't care if there's male and females in the, in the field, right? Uh, and in fact, you know, if you're growing grain, you need males and females in the field or you're not going to get seed, right? Uh, cannabinoids are a little different. And as Caleb mentioned uh, earlier, I think he said roughly 90% of the growers in Arkansas are growing for CBD. And that's about what we've had the last two seasons in Kentucky. Uh, I think in 2019, 92% of growers were growing for CBD. And last year, 95% uh, of growers were growing for CBD. Um, 
So really right now, because CBD, you can grow it on a smaller acreage. Uh, there is a little bit more processing infrastructure out there than there is for fiber and grain. Uh, so people have gotten into this CBD production. And initially speaking, you know, 2016, 2017, 2018, people were making more money on their CBD uh, than they than you could grain now. now all the market uh, take a big nosedive, and I'll show you some pictures of that here in a minute. Anyway, um, cannabinoids are a little different. We, we take the males out of the field, and I'll talk a little bit about that here in a few slides. What we're really shooting for, for growing for cannabinoids, is these mature flowers. We want mature female flowers, because most of your uh, CBD the highest concentrations of CBD and also the highest concentrations of THC are in these female flowers. Um, cannabinoid varieties, you got to be careful with. Uh, you know, Caleb talked about the testing protocols that they have in Arkansas, um, and, and we have similar protocols here uh, for KDA coming out and testing your fields uh, to make sure you're compliant with respect to THC. These cannabinoid varieties don't just push closer to the 0.3% THC limit. A lot of them will go over the THC limit if you're not careful. And my recommendation to growers is as you are approaching harvest, you need to start sampling your crop uh, before you think about sending uh, the note to your uh, state lab to have them come out and test for compliance. You want to have an idea what your CBD and THC looks like uh, before you consider harvesting because you know, these THC and CBD increase together uh, proportionally. And so the more mature they get, the more CBD your plant gets, but also the more THC your plant gets. So you want to get the most CBD out of it before that THC uh, starts reaching that point where you're gonna test hot. Uh, so my recommendation is, you know, uh, sometime late August, early September, to your uh, local testing lab so you can get an idea of, of what your cannabinoid profile looks like. When you're growing for cannabinoids, it's pretty labor intensive. Uh, in Kentucky, uh, you know, we're an old tobacco state. And so uh, the people that are getting into hemp, tobacco, pretty labor intensive crop, uh, they seem to do better than the people that are coming from corn and grain uh, production uh, the first couple of years. There's a learning curve to it. And if you're used to working with these more labor intensive crops like tobacco, um, you know, you're probably a little better off. Um, again, you know, people have gotten into cannabinoid production because you can get in on a smaller acreage. Usually we start seeds indoors, uh, you know, Typical field planting rate for cannabinoid production is 1,200 to 1,500 plants per acre. Um, and the spacing depends. And I say it depends uh, because different varieties have different sizes. Um, you know, some people are starting from um, just raw seed that could give you male or female. Some people are starting from seed that they think is gonna give them mostly female. Uh, feminized seed, uh, and then some people are growing from clones, which are vegetatively propagated female plants. And clones, you should have yield, and so they give them a little wider spacing um, so that they can uh, fill out. Uh, people who are growing from seed that may give you male or female uh, will grow on a smaller spacing uh, because they know they're going to be taking about half their plants out. Uh, when they call the males. This is a picture of an early female flower. And so when you're, if you're growing from seed, uh, just raw seed that hasn't been treated. So I should, I should clarify, I mentioned feminized seed. Feminized seed is seed that has been treated uh, to give you on paper, all female plants. I've never actually seen it be uh, a field of 100% female plants coming from feminized seed. Uh, and so my recommendation is even if you're growing from feminized seed, uh, you need to be scouting your field looking for male and female plants. <clears throat> this is early onset female flowers. These two stigma, uh, little white hairs coming out um, are your early indication that it's a female plant. Uh, 
these little pod-like structures uh, are early indications that it's a male plant. And if you see these, uh, you should pull these plants from your field or you're going to have a seeded crop. Male flowers, uh, and you can see they're dumping pollen out there. Uh, and so, you know, again, the goal for cannabinoid crops for growers is to produce uh, a crop that has as little pollination taking place as possible. Uh, so uh, if you're seeing flowers like this and you got pollen in the field, you're going to have seeds. These are um, female flowers that are more mature than the one we looked at in the previous slide. So this is probably about five or six weeks into flowering uh, here on the, uh, the left. And then this is a closer to mature female flower here on the right. As I mentioned earlier, you know, if you're involved in a cannabinoid crop and you, you, you know, again, you need to take your males out of your field, uh, it's, it's helpful to know that the males tend to flower first. Uh, and so in this picture, you can see um, these, these are male plants here, the taller ones, and they have already fully flowered. This is in a fiber crop, so this is not a CBD crop. Um, and that's why you're seeing both male and female. Male plants are still, they're still putting on a lot. Of course, it's all going into flower at this point, but uh, the male plants are pretty much done. They have done their job, they have pollinated. Uh, and so they, they flower first and mature faster, uh, and then the females will continue to develop. But you know, the fact that they do flower first, if you start seeing flowers, the first flowers you really see, you wanna watch them because uh, uh, they, uh, Generally, the first ones you'll see in a field will turn out to be male plants. It's not all, you know, you got to be careful. You got to verify, but, but a mental note, if you start seeing a plant flowering real early, uh, that might be a male. As far as um, harvesting your cannabinoid crops, most of the growers I know in Kentucky are harvesting by hand. When I say that, they'll have teams of people out in the field chopping the plants down uh, and hauling them to wherever they're going to be dried. There is some equipment out there, like this tractor here, uh, that will uh, harvest your plants and take them, uh, you know, offload them onto a trailer and they take them off to be dried. You want to get them dried down to about 12% moisture. That's at the point where uh, you're not looking at a mold problem in your, in your drying plants. I'll show you some pictures of our harvest at KSU here in a minute. I uh, just wanted to give you an idea what we're doing at KSU. Um, most of my research, again, has been focused on organic hemp. Now, we have done some work uh, on organic hemp in fiber and grain uh, and how that fits into a crop root. But the last couple of years, given that 90% of our growers in Kentucky are focusing on CBD production, we've really kind of honed in on CBD production and we're looking for varieties that perform well in Kentucky uh, that remain compliant but give us higher levels of uh, CBD. Uh, and we're looking at how they respond to a couple of different organic fertilization products from Alltech. Uh, so I've got a couple of partners on this. Kyogen has supplied some of the genetics. Third Way Farm has supplied some of the genetics and Alltech has uh, supplied some of the uh, um, organic approved OMRI listed uh, bio fertilization products that I can use in organic production. And the neat thing that we're doing with these Alltech products is we're, we're looking at how uh, the plants respond to that, both in terms of yield, but also in terms of, you know, THC compliance and CBD levels. Uh, so uh, the idea here is, you know, we really need to find strains that remain compliant and uh, that, that give us reasonable flower yield uh, and give us a good level of the cannabinoids that we're interested in without going hot. This was our crop in 2019, right before we harvested. This is the CBD crop. Uh, this is one of my staff members in the field, uh, harvesting by hand. And we were using a hay wagon, uh, you know, filling up the hay wagon. And we'd, we were actually 
uh, collecting data on this on the way. So it makes a stop at our, uh, our field uh, facility, uh, our shed, and we weigh the plants uh, fresh. Uh, and then we take them back to our barn and we dry them in the barn. And then we'll weigh them again dry. Uh, and then we'll collect our samples from these plants uh, for potency analysis. Uh, this is what a farmer that I worked with last year and the year before did uh, to dry his plants. He had four high tunnels. He covered them with a dual layer of shade cloth and he hung his plants inside his high tunnels. Of course, we're in Kentucky. Uh, I'm in Kentucky. We've got a lot of old tobacco barns and so people are using tobacco barns uh, for a lot of their drying as well. The idea here with these CBD crops is we want the flower. So um, people will take the flower and collect it from the crop. Again, this is the farmer that was uh, hanging his in uh, his greenhouses with the shade cloth on top. Uh, and this is a friend of mine stripping the flowers off of the uh, stalks into a bin, collecting those. Uh, she's working with a specialized uh, bucket lid that you just pull the stalk through and the uh, the flower comes right off the stalk into the bin. Um, most people that I work with just put on a work glove and shuck it by hand. It seems to be a little quicker. There are specialized tools. There's now some mechanized equipment that'll do this for you. Uh, again, some of that gets pretty pricey. Um, speaking of prices, okay. So I told you I'd mention a little bit about market. Um, January 2019, people were getting $3.50 per percentage point of CBD per pound of floral material. In other words, if you had a 10% CBD crop, you'd get 35 bucks a pound for that biomass. And that's, you know, one of the reasons why a lot of growers jumped in uh, in 2019 is they, you know, they, they saw these prices coming out of 2018 into 2019, uh, you know, and people were thinking, well, how much can I get out of a, a field, you know, that, that uh, has two or three acres and I'm getting 35 bucks a pound and I'm, you know, each plant has about, I've got 1200 plants per acre and people are doing the math and they're coming up with pretty big numbers. And so a lot of people got into, uh, you know, hemp production in 2019, especially since that 2018 farm bill passed. Well, a whole lot of people got in. And what ultimately happened is uh, a couple of things ultimately happened. You know, we had a market saturation of floral material. Price went from $35 a pound down to about $7.40 a pound for a 10% CBD crop. Uh, one year 2020. Right now, it's about $4 a pound for a 10% CBD crop. <clears throat> so you're looking at from January 2019 to January 2020, a 78% decrease in uh, the amount that people were getting for their crops, if they could sell them at all. And that was one of the other problems that we saw uh, in 2019 and in 2020 is that, um, particularly 2019, processors overpromised. Uh, at least the ones here in Kentucky. We had several major processors in Kentucky um, that were pretty well known nationally and uh, in, at least in hemp circles and all of them are bankrupt now. Uh, and that left a lot of farmers holding their crops. Uh, a lot of farmers last year uh, were dumping the material that they grew in uh, 2019 because they couldn't sell it. Uh, you know, this graph basically shows you what I just showed you in the previous slide. Again, January, you're up here about, you know, a uh, little over four bucks uh, per point per pound. It went down, you know, January 20 to, again, you know, under a dollar a pound. So this is the, the guy who grew uh, the high tunnels that I showed you uh, with the shade cloth. Um, his, his, this was after he got done processing the flour, storing it in these giant super sacks. Uh, and we're in what, January of 2021 now? He still has uh, quite a few of these super sacks sitting around. He's actually dumped a few of them 
uh, in his high tunnels uh, because he couldn't sell them. And this is certified organic material. This is uh, material that uh, he thought he'd, you know, the organic aspect of it would give him some insurance um, over, you know, all the other growers out there that were not growing certified organic, but he didn't do any better than anybody else because he ended up having to dump it. Um, so, uh, again, the market in 2020, we're looking at 40 cents per point per pound uh, in late 2020. Uh, I don't think these numbers have gone up too much. So that's about four bucks a pound for a 10% CBD crop. But again, you know, the market just was saturated and, and farmers uh, had a hard time moving their crop. And so Caleb made a very good point earlier and a couple people asked questions about linkages between processors and, 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 and producers. Uh, you know, my recommendation is if someone is getting into this and they think they have a processor lined up and they've got a contract in hand, have a lawyer look at the contract. Make sure you have a lawyer look at the contract. Uh, the processor agreements are generally set up to favor the processor and they, uh, a lot of hemp, I'll just say that a lot of Kentucky hemp farmers, again, had contracts in hand in 2019. And uh, even though they had the contract in hand, they still didn't sell their crop because these processors went bankrupt or they opted out of the contract. They have all kinds of out clauses in them. Have a lawyer look at your contracts. We do have some other legal concerns. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, these CBD varieties tend to push right up against that 0.3% uh, THC threshold. And so, um, you know, what you're looking at in this graph, this is from Kentucky Department of Ag's summary of varieties. Caleb mentioned his summary of varieties for uh, Depar Department of Ag in Arkansas. Um, the summary of varieties basically tells producers, you know, how these plants did with respect to uh, testing hot or testing compliant. Um, and so our summary of varieties in Kentucky, it'll tell you whether it tested hot um, what percentage of plants tested hot, and then eventually, if too many of them test hot, it'll be a prohibited variety, right? Um, so these are five varieties that were commonly grown in Kentucky, CBD RX Cherry, uh, Cherry Wine, Sweetened, T1, and Wife. Uh, these are all varieties that are pretty commonly grown in Kentucky. Now, if it's a green bar, it was compliant, uh, according to the summary of varieties. If it's a blue bar, it tested between 0.3 and 0.39% THC. And in Kentucky, underneath, uh, under, the, under the guidelines for the research program, and of course, Caleb mentioned going forward, everything's gonna be under the USDA guidance um, and it's gonna be total THC. They have very cleanly defined um, what the level of wiggle room they're going to have between the 0.3%. And by wiggle room, I mean, you know, in Kentucky, under our research program, we're allowed to go up to 0.399. And so once you hit that 4.4, you've got to destroy your crop or you can request a retest up to 1%. Uh, if you're over 1%, it's automatic destruction. If you're under 1%, you can request a retest. Um, and sometimes people might work a few more stems in their, in their crop and the <laughs> test's a little lower the next time they test it. Uh, but, uh, with this figure, for almost all these varieties, between 50 and 60% of them are testing compliant. But then you've got another roughly 30 in that gray area between 0.3 and 0.399 and then you got a another 20 percent roughly that's in that area that's 0.4 or above but if you take the blue line and the and the red lines and you add them together you're looking about 50 percent of the tests that were conducted in Kentucky uh, tested over that 0.3 percent so that's hot and again, it's a little tighter rules under the USDA guidelines uh, going forward. And so people really need to be aware of what they're working with as far as genetic material uh, and what the, how those plants perform in the field. 
And this is again why I recommend that people need to test their crops before they request their uh, state program to come out and test uh, for harvest compliance. This is some data that we generated at KSU. Uh, what you're looking at here is from our variety trial. Uh, and so uh, we had a range of plants that uh, were down around 1% CBD all the way up to about 16% oh, CBD. Uh, but you could see this is a super tight uh, linear relationship. Uh, as the CBD is going up, THC is also going up. And we found that right around 8%, if you're around 8% CBD, uh, you're going to be running the risk of being over that 0.3% THC threshold. Now, there is certainly some variability from variety to variety. Uh, and, and I should caution you that this is only four varieties, right? And there are a lot more than four hemp varieties out there. And so, you know, genetics does play a role in some of this. Uh, again, it just, it, an inkling of face as far as compliance. So, all right, if, if, you, if you want me to give you my take home points on this, uh, and forgive me if I went a little over time, I suspect I might have. Um, but this is really still a, we're, we're four years, five years, six years in now, uh, from the 2014 farm bill. Uh, and now we're getting into this 2018 farm bill, but there's still a lot of legal gray areas. Uh, the market is all over the place. It's volatile. There's a lot of optimism about the market and people think that fiber and grain ultimately are probably going to be your most, um, not necessarily profitable, but stable, in other words, less of a gamble uh, crop opportunities. Uh, but this market's all over the place right now. Uh, and so there's a lot of risk. And I always tell farmers, don't plant more than you can afford to lose. Start very small, little plots mean little mistakes. Uh, there's a learning curve to this crop. Um, but again, you know, with the volatility, uh, the running the risk of having to destroy your crop because it tests hot, you know, don't plant more than you can afford to lose. Uh, with respect to your planting stock, develop a relationship with someone you trust uh, for seeds and clones. Um, again, I've seen, I've seen people's, people's fields that uh, were supposed to be from feminized seed and look just like a, you know, a regular hemp field where, you know, 50% of the plants were males, 50% of the plants were females. Uh, and, and, but people paid double the price for so-called feminized seed that were supposed to be 99% male or female rather, 99% female. Um, again, there's a learning curve, you know, I'm the organic guy at KSU. So I always plug taking care of your soils, feed your soil to feed your crop. Uh, Caleb mentioned this earlier too. have a market lined up before you plant a that notion. And I'm going to say, you know, even if you do think you've got your market lined up, be very careful and have uh, someone with a legal eye take a look at the contract. And uh, that's, that's all I've got. Uh, I, I, I should thank my staff at KSU. I wouldn't be able to do this work without them and a couple of collaborators, Third Wave Farm, Kaya Jean Altec, uh, Dr. D'Angelo at University of Kentucky, uh, lets me do some things in her lab when we're not in the middle of COVID uh, that uh, that uh, I can't do at KSU. Uh, so you know, I've, I've had a lot of help uh, generating this information. I will say also before I answer questions that we do have, uh, uh, in December, I put together a fact sheet uh, that will give you a lot of the information that's in here and a little bit more. Um, it's a production fact sheet. Uh, so uh, it's gone through the peer review process uh, and we're just getting the, the, uh, uh, the extension publication folks at KSU are, are putting the finishing touches on it now. Uh, so when that's available, I'd be happy to send it out to y'all. Thank you, Dr. Lucas. Uh, right now it's 1035 and it 1035, I think Rusty Rumley from the National Agriculture Law Center is supposed to speak. Is Rusty available? I, I'm on. Okay, okay. 
with that, what we will do is uh, please put any question that you would have for Dr. Lucas in the chat box. We will try to, we will get that to him and we will try to get those answers to you. I think some of you may want copies of his PowerPoint. We'll ask him if that is available, et cetera. But due to time constraints, uh, we will have to go directly to the next speaker. We cannot take any questions. Again, thank you so much, Dr. Lucas. Yes, and I did send this PowerPoint to, uh, to Kelly earlier. Good. And, and so if, uh, if she wants to share that with anybody, uh, they're welcome to have it. And again, I'm welcome to, I will provide the fact sheet if people want it. All right. And could you leave your email address in case someone wanted to uh, contact you directly with some yep. questions? So the email address is on the bottom of this slide and, uh, okay. and, and uh, Kelly has it from earlier. All right, thank you. Okay, with that, uh, Rusty. Go ahead, Rusty. Mm -hmm. All right, let me go ahead and uh, share my screen here. Let's make sure it. All right, you guys able to see my screen, my slides? Yes. yes. All right, great. Had trouble with this before. Uh, so like Dr. Lucas mentioned, we've got a lot of there that still have not been resolved, industrial hemp. So I wanna to try to cover them. I saw Caleb spoke earlier. I'm sure he covered quite a few of these from the Arkansas perspective. So I'll, I'll try to breeze through that and try to leave a little bit more like uh, talk about we're going to talk about the farm bill of 14 the 2018 farm bill kind of where we're at at the state level and then looking uh, to the federal level and see where we're at uh, one thing I'm going to mention is this has been a slow process like dr. Lucas talked about uh, especially the the 14 farm bill everything was geared more toward research this was geared toward learning how to actually grow this crop again there's a lot of legal hurdles that we needed to figure out how we were going to work through. And uh, if you would have asked me uh, this time last year, would we have a lot more stuff done than we currently have? I would have said absolutely so. But a little thing called COVID-19 popped up and it really seemed to derail a lot of the, the workings on hemp. So we've gotten a few more questions or answers. Still got quite a bit out there that's uh, that's needing to be addressed. Uh, I'm sure they've already talked about uh, what is hemp. Uh, the thing I do want to stress is that, uh, you know, I, I was, I'm sure Caleb mentioned as well as Dr. Lucas did, that 0.3% is important. And I know a lot of people will gripe and say, well, you know, states need to change their, their definition of, you know, what's an allowable level of THC. Well, right now that's actually set by Congress. I mean, it's 0.3% it's and USDA seems to, they're going to hold to that 0.3%. Uh, I will say that uh, Senator Paul out of Kentucky, right before Christmas, or actually it might've been right after Christmas, dropped a proposed bill wanting to raise the, the legal limit for industrial hemp all the way up to 1%. I mean, it was, the way it was dropped, it was so late in the legislative cycle, there was no way for it to go forward but he was basically putting a chit down on the table, saying that this is something that I'm, I'm intending to bring up again next year. So I, I fully expect to see that piece of legislation filed once uh, the next Congress officially begins. But until something like that happens, the 0.3% is what we have to, uh, to work with at the moment. Uh, like I said, I'm sure that uh, they've talked about it. The, the thing that's really been the kicker with industrial hemp has been the THC uh, from the legal side. Um, you know, once we had the Controlled Substances Act of 1970 go into effect, any THC was a Schedule One controlled narcotic. And by definition, a Schedule One narcotic has no useful benefits, period. Like by law, has no useful benefits. So a lot of things like research or, or other activities were just curtailed just by very definition. Uh, universities tend to do a lot of the research for varieties. 
you know, we're primarily funded uh, through the federal government. Does it violate federal law can subject us to potentially losing some of our, some or all of our federal funding. So a lot of universities, you know, even after the 2014 Farm Bill, a lot of your universities really didn't want to touch hemp just because they did not want to risk those federal funds. So that, that's really slowed down the, the growth of the hemp industry. And like I said, I'm primarily, I'm gonna talk about CBD production because as both Caleb and Dr. Lucas talked about, you know, it's 90 to 95% of all the people I know that are growing are, are going for the, the CBD uh, varieties. Uh, and I'm, as I'm sure that you guys have already heard, you know, this is extremely labor intensive. Uh, the cost can be extremely high, especially for the CBD production. Uh, you know, seeds are high, you know, one to $2 per seed is not that uh, out of the ballpark, especially for feminized seed. Uh, when you get into clones, uh, you're talking about more than that. So, you know, at those stocking rates of, you know, 1500 plants an acre, you know, that, that adds up really quickly. Uh, AMS actually estimated that some CBD varieties could cost as much as $19,000 per acre to put in. So very, uh, can be very financially high risk. So the 2014 Farm Bill, this is uh, kind of our segue back into uh, to hemp production here in the United States. This was geared towards research. This was really not supposed to establish a new uh, hemp industry. Uh, when you look at the 14 Farm Bill, they don't really take hemp out of the Controlled Substances Act. Uh, they basically just say small exception and this exception is going to be research and this research is going to be performed by state universities and state ag departments. And that's, we're going to learn how to grow hemp again. It was a pilot program. So like I said, this wasn't intended to be a, a full on commercial hemp production program. Uh, yeah, like I said, limited to institutions of higher education, which typically was the land grant university in the state or the 1890 school in the state um, or the state departments of ag through limited uh, licenses being issued. This was what was written in the law. This happened. Uh, Kentucky's a really Really put, I, they really opened this. I, I that you know, uh, research goes, you know, to research what uh, uh, would be to do market research other than open up the industry and expose it to, you know, the, the market itself. So, you know, that's the best data you can get is if you just kick the doors open and, and go for broke. And, uh, one, it is a good way to get uh, data. It really wasn't the purpose behind what they were wanting to do back in 2014. Uh, why do I mention the 2014 Farm Bill? We're actually still operating under the 2014 Farm Bill in Arkansas. And we're right now the plans are we're going to be doing it again this year. Uh, just recently, we were supposed to, every state was supposed to switch over to the 18 Farm Bill. Uh, one of the continuing resolutions back in October of last year actually it contained an, uh, a provision allowing for those states still operating under the 14 Farm Bill to do it for one more season. Uh, the thought was that USDA last year would finalize the regulations and, and kind of give everyone uh, an equal playing field. Uh, there wasn't a whole lot of progress made uh, there were some changes that were made, and we'll talk about some of those. But uh, we still got some legal questions that are out there. So it's probably not a bad idea at all for Arkansas and other states that were operating under the 14 Farm Bill to just keep up doing that for the next year, because the only thing we know for sure is there's probably going to be some more changes being done. So <clears throat> uh, the one thing that we did take out of the uh, 14 or the 18 Farm Bill, they officially removed industrial hemp from the Schedule One of the Controlled Substances Act. 
uh, this is kind of one of those things that really led to that boom back last year in 2019. You know, the questions about legality, you know, that, that as long as you were under the 0.3% with the control, that actually was the lawyers really. I mean, you had some lawyers that were uh, in the hemp industry. There's really enough of them, though, to uh, to service all of the growers and the, the production companies. And one of the reasons for that is, as a lawyer, I'm not allowed to assist my client in a criminal endeavor. Once they've completed that criminal endeavor, I can represent them. I can't provide any representation on the front end or during a, the commission of a criminal enterprise. And you know, so long as uh, uh, THC was on the Controlled Substances Act, any, you know, really any portion, there was a big question on whether or not lawyers could be disbarred for even doing things like creating business entities uh, for farmers or processors, or even reviewing those production contracts. So because of that, you've, you've ended up with a lot of really bad contracts out there because there just wasn't anyone that was able to, to look at the, the agreements. That is starting to change, however. Uh, we also have a felony conviction requirement. I, I always make sure to throw this one out there. Uh, if someone has <clears throat> a felony conviction for controlled substances in the past 10 years, they cannot get a license and they cannot be someone that's on an application. They can't have a substantial uh, stake in any business related to industrial hemp production. So just something to, to throw out there. Uh, I know we've been contacted here uh, by several people, uh, especially on these CBD varieties. Uh, there's not a whole lot of difference between the the, the way these some of these CBD varieties are grown and how marijuana is grown. So a lot of the people out there that have the most experience with these plants may not necessarily be able to get a license and that's caused some consternation. But uh, that is a, a requirement that the 18 Farm Bills established. Uh, what the 18 Farm Bill has done, so this is not going to be something that you know, most of this stuff is not going to be things that Arkansas has to be concerned about this year. Next year, though, we are going to probably have to be under the, the 2018 Farm Bill. By and large, we're fairly compliant. Uh, a lot of the stuff that we have already, uh, we, we look a lot like Kentucky. And whenever USDA went in and did their regs, the regs look a whole lot like Kentucky. I mean, AMS sent people out to Kentucky to see how they ran their program, and you know, voila, it looks fairly similar to uh, the Kentucky approach. Not exact, but pretty close. A couple of things that we are watching for in this uh, that have uh, really caused some legal issues: the this a procedure for testing with the either post decarb or some other similarly reliable methods. This 0.3%, <clears throat> this is that for the total THC, this has been a big issue. Disposal of plants that have tested hot, that's been a big issue. That's something that AMS addressed somewhat last year. Uh, and then kind of looking at the, the states themselves, what kind of plan they have to, to go forward. That's something that we're watching as well. So that's some of the things I, I'll want to press on briefly. <clears throat> so the rules came out, they were interim final rules. So what that means is they're not the final, final rule test run. They pretty similar to what the final rules are going to be. But the goal was they would do an interim final rule Halloween of 2019. You would have the 2020 growing season. And then the thought was October, November, after the, the crop's been harvested, you know, take and then do a final calculations and then worth under the the 2018 farm bill covid kind of messed up that whole train so that's why we see the fix that was thrown in in that continuing resolution allowing for those 2014 farm bill states to uh to maintain their programs for another year 
Uh, we've had some uh, issues come up. Uh, one of the biggest ones, and it's still unresolved, is how does C what is how does CBD get treated? You know, is it legal to use? And uh, we've even seen some recent issues with that, and we'll, that we'll talk about. <clears throat> So all the, the uh, Farm Bill did was they actually went in, they allowed for cultivation on the federal level, but one thing most people don't realize is that most states actually have their own Controlled Substances Act, and most states basically just copied and pasted the federal one. So all the states that want to do their own program have to go back in and have to define and legalize industrial hemp. So currently we've, we're up to 48 states that have done it. Uh, Mississippi still hasn't done it for those of you that are close to the border. So that's, that's one of the states, you know, you kind of need to, to watch. Uh, they've made progress toward it. They've had a couple of proposed bills. None of them have quite made it across the, the finish line. <clears throat> uh, you know, different states have different levels of programs. Some are extremely comprehensive and others might just have a definition and uh, uh, have legalized it. Uh, Kentucky's kind of been at the forefront when it comes to uh, a developed industry. Uh, we do have all the state's laws if you're interested in looking at them. Uh, Arkansas has theirs up on the plant board website, which is a really good resource if you guys haven't uh, been there already. Highly recommend it. <clears throat> uh, here's the actual citations to the Arkansas law. The regulations, as I mentioned earlier, they're up on the, the plant board's website. Just search Arkansas hemp. <clears throat> Fees have been another big issue that growers across the country have had to deal with. And I can tell you right now that the fees that people pay in different states can vary dramatically. Uh, some states, it's you know fifty dollars for a license, and then you might have to pay a hundred dollars for a test. Uh, others, uh, it could be pretty substantial. Uh, so just realize that you know it's really important to go out there before you get uh, too far down the road and see what your license fees are going to be. Uh, in some states, you know, it may not be that big of a problem to have two or three different small plots at different locations. Other states that may end up really raising your costs having different plots. So you may just want to do one larger, one larger uh, area where you're cultivating. Spend a little bit of time, make sure you go through your uh, fees. And I said, this is from the Arkansas Plant Board website, but this is their uh, hemp licensing program. Everyone pays a $50 application fee to kind of start the ball rolling. And then after that, your fees are going to be determined on what you're uh, wanting to do exactly. Uh, a couple of important dates for you guys here in our grower, April 30th is when you need to have your application in, April 2nd for uh, renewing growers. Uh, renewing processors is May 28th. The new processors can apply at any time. So some of the regulations. So as I mentioned before, we still don't have final regulations. We're still waiting to see what AMS is going to do. Uh, there's been a lot of issues uh, that we've had to, to wrestle with. Dr. Lucas mentioned about the sampling. You know, he said, well, you know, one way you can get your uh, THC levels down is to include a few more stems. Uh, AMS has got a, a guide on where they think that the sampling should be, where, where you should make the cut, like the bud and how much of the stem should be included. Uh, that's actually not a rule though. It's a, a guidance document that they can change at any time. Uh, so, you know, playing with those kind of sampling requirements can definitely change uh, THC testing results. The more stem and leaves you include in there, the lower your THC uh, percentage is going to be. Uh, so that, that's kind of been one of those issues that's been going on. Uh, some states have wanted, you know, farmers to send in their own samples. Other states uh, are sending out people to take the samples. Uh, it's kind of a, can be a little bit of a logistical problem though, if you've got a, a bunch of people 
you know, everyone's crops kind of coming, uh, getting ready all at the same time. And since the longer you wait, the THC levels go, you know, it's kind of a, a hurry. Uh, you wait, 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 and then you got to hurry up and harvest. So that can create some logistical problems for people. Uh, some states have gone the certified seed route. Uh, AMS actually chose not to do that route. Uh, Dr. Lucas mentioned that their seed varieties and how they'll ban certain seed varieties if you know they, they see a, a lot of the crops testing hot. Uh, AMS basically felt at the time there wasn't enough good data to certain uh, seed varieties or restrict others, especially across the entire country. There just wasn't enough data. So AMS has kind of stayed away from that. Uh, what do you do if your crop test saw it? You know, that that was been a, a, an issue for a lot of people. Uh, and then we'll look at the CBD issue as well. <clears throat> so as I mentioned earlier, the sampling has been kind of a, a, a tricky issue. You know, the more stem you include, the, the lower your THC level is going to be. Uh, Early on, they required that these samples be, they wanted them sent to a DEA registered laboratory. Uh, they've since, they've came back and walked that back. They really didn't know how many DEA registered laboratories were even out there. Uh, it doesn't seem like there was going to be enough to satisfy the testing requirements. That got pulled back. Uh, they also went back to disposal of the crop. Uh, used uh, under the previous version, they wanted it destroyed uh, using DEA methodology, which basically was, you know, you gather it up and burn it. Uh, they've introduced a little bit more flexibility. Now they're allowing people to mow it or disc it under. It just has to be rendered so that it's not, you know, usable or edible uh, in any way. Um, <clears throat> the THC testing. This has probably been. This is probably the most important issue that we saw in the regulations. Uh, some states were, uh, gave more wiggle room than uh, basically almost every state gave more wiggle room than what USDA finally ended up coming up with. Uh, they're pretty hard and fast to that 0.3%. Uh, other states have, you know, have, you know, they didn't want to look at the total THC, which I'm sure Caleb talked about how they, they uh, uh, tested or do those tests. I'm not going to cover that, but uh, they are looking at the total THC. Uh, and since it's a farm bill said 0.3%, they're sticking to the 0.3%. Uh, there's been, because of the, the testing methodology out there the last couple of years, uh, tests don't always show you know, different tests don't show the same result. Uh, and different labs have different levels of accuracy. So was they went in going to use a uncertainty measurement? And this is basically assigned to your lab. Uh, it's not a whole lot of flexibility though. Uh, and, and this is something that's more of a, a calculation done based on the lab. This is not something. So we had state legislators calling in wanting to know basically, could they just by law create an uncertainty measurement of 1%? <laughs> so that, you know, anything that tested 1.3% or below total THC was was going to be legal. And the answer was no. I mean, this this uncertainty measurement is something that, you know, the, the labs uh, have to turn in themselves based on their methodology, their equipment, Usually this is, you know, 0 0.03, 0 0.05, you know, just basically a plus or minus. You know, if you're a little bit over and your measurement of uncertainty covers that range, uh, you're still going to be allowed. So the 0.3% is not perfect. It's not a drop dead level, but uh, it's, it's still pretty close to that. I mean, you really can't get much over the 0.3% and, uh, and still be considered hemp. Uh, by USDA. <clears throat> like I said, I already talked about the certified seeds. Uh, what if your crop test's hot? So it's been something uh, right now, we don't really have anything in regulations on the destruction 
AMS has basically suspended their rules uh, for the DEA coming out to destroy it. Like they've given guidance, you know, you can mow it, you can disc it under, you can mulch it, but there really hasn't been much in the way of final I'll rely on. Uh, hopefully sometime this year, uh, AMS will get those final regs out there and we'll see how they're uh, supposed to be disposed of. But one thing that's important to know from the legal side is that once your crop officially tests hot and you don't have any other recourse, like you, you know, you've already done your second sample or something like that, it's no longer hemp. You have marijuana. And that's, that's been DEA's big push is that, you know, Congress legalized hemp. They didn't legalize marijuana. Hemp is identified as 0.3% or less total THC by dry weight. And if you're above that, you no longer have hemp. This has caused other ramifications going down the, uh, through the chain. So one big one has meant crop insurance. So when Dr. Lucas was talking about, you know, you really need to start testing your crop late August into early September and doing those tests a long basis to see what their THC level is. The reason for that is uh, you might have a, a semi-valuable hemp crop going up until the date of harvest. Once that THC level rises above the legal limit, you no longer have hemp, you have marijuana. At that point, your crop is a uh, some states before the regulations were out, you know, the states that had uh, medicinal marijuana or recreational marijuana, you know, growers might be able to uh, sell those crops over uh, to uh, a licensee on the other side. That's not allowed under the regulations. Uh, you're supposed to dispose of the crop, so it's going to be a total loss. So what about crop insurance? Uh, Federal crop insurance will not cover hot crops. Uh, the way they phrase it is, we insure hemp, we don't insure marijuana. And once your crop goes hot, it's no longer hemp, it's marijuana. So early on, you know, we don't know how much, we've heard about you know, stressors bringing up THC levels. You know, with your common crops, so I mean, if you're growing tomatoes and you have a drought comes through and it hurts your yield, no problem, turn it in. You can, you know, depending upon your policy, you can probably get paid back for those losses. Uh, if you have a hemp crop and you have environmental stressors and those end up jumping your THC levels uh, so that your crop is hot, you lose out on everything. Uh, what if you're, uh, what if it comes through and not just stresses the crop, what if it wipes it out completely? In that case, you're entitled to, uh, getting paid back on your policy so long as your other th other uh, factors are met. So it's really caused some questions to pop up in the, the area of crop insurance. <clears throat> so CBD oil and the FDA. This is probably one of the biggest open legal areas that we have at the moment. Uh, everyone's growing, uh, almost everyone's growing C uh, the industrial hemp for CBD production. Currently right now, CBD oil is, you're not legally supposed to be using it as a food or a dietary supplement. And I know that's what everyone says, but Rusty, we see stores that sell CBD oil all over the place. They're not supposed to be doing it. It's technically not legal to be adding CBD oil to foods or uh, dietary supplements or other things like that. In the past, FDA has really not even dealt with people making these uh, selling these products unless they were making really egregious health claims. And even then they were just sending them cease and desist letters. Uh, this has recently changed. They have started going back in and fining companies for making health claims. But I mean, we're seeing things like, you know, people are advertising their CBD as curing cancer, curing fibromyalgia. I mean, just anything you can think of, people were, anything that they thought they could could raise the price of their product, people were making those claims. And none of it was really backed up uh, of scientific evidence, <clears throat> which has led to a bunch of wonderful memes out there on the internet about uh, the efficacy of CBD 
or sometimes the dangers of where you are buying your CBD oil from. The thing that's really caused the problem with CBD is that in the United States, the, you know, we have the Federal Food and Drug Cosmetic Act, and there is a specific provision in here called the drug exclusion rule. And what it, this applies to is you can't put registered drugs, like not illegal drugs, we're talking medical drugs, into foods or dietary supplements. So for example, I can't go out there and create headache fighting milkshakes and just start adding a bunch of aspirin to milkshakes and selling it to people because aspirin's a, a, a recognized drug. You're not allowed to add that to food products. The thing with uh, CBD is it's actually been approved as a, a treatment for several rare forms of childhood epilepsy at very, at very highly refined levels. <clears throat> so FDA's approach is, you know, this is not just that we don't know about. This is actually, a, this is actually an epilepsy medicine that you guys are, are selling. So we do know that it has medicinal benefits. Those medicinal benefits are for the treatment of childhood epilepsy. When I mentioned earlier that in the United States, we weren't allowed to do research on this, this research was actually done in England. And the, this Epidiolex is actually a, an English medication that's been approved subsequently in the United States. So this has been the thing that's really held back on the CBD production or the, on the usage of CBD. Uh, this is why you're seeing it sold like in small health food stores, why you're seeing it sold in gas stations. You're really not seeing much of the big the big retailers dealing with it. We saw some dabble in it. Uh, Carl's Jr. did the Mile High Burger a couple of years ago back in, uh, in Denver. They were selling uh, uh, hamburgers with CBD special sauce on them. And there's been a few other things like that. But most of your big retailers have kind of stayed away from CBD just because there's these questions on the legality. Uh, my guess and the guess what, uh, that we're kind of hearing from most people is they're probably going to allow CBD to be used as a dietary supplement or a food additive. They're probably just going to reduce the amount in the this highly refined CBD that has medicinal value, you know, maybe cut it down substantially. And if it's diluted enough, it may not have medical efficacy. And that's kind of the goal. Uh, we got a lot of people asking, well, you know, the 2018 Farm Bill made industrial hemp legal. Since CBD is what everyone's growing it for, why isn't it covered? And the reason for it is <clears throat> Congress actually excluded that uh, from modifying the Federal Food and Drug Cosmetic Act. So uh, FDA still has to go through all the, the loops and hurdles that they would normally do on a food additive or a dietary supplement. And since it's already been approved as a drug, that makes it much more problematic to do. Uh, probably our guess, I mean, FDA's, you know, they, they've been moving through the process. It's a slow process. My guess is that Congress is going to probably push them. Uh, you probably see something in an appropriations bill basically forcing FDA to approve it at, at some level. But since FDA has really been kind of you know, hanging back, states have been bouncing all around on what they're going to do. Uh, some states are allowing CBD production or it, it dietary supplement following, just say, hey, you know, if the Fed say it's illegal, we say it's illegal. But uh, right now, this really been a, a gray area and it's something that's hurt the, the market for CBD is this legal uncertainty. You know, there's only so much you can sell at those small locations. You need some bigger retailers to, uh, to pick the product up. <clears throat> Processing has been a, another major issue. Uh, typically what happens is, you know, uh, you'll have like your state ag department or USDA be involved on the growing side. And then on the processing side, you'll see FDA or your uh, state health department that'll be more in charge of doing things like inspecting the facilities and looking at the labels on products. 
and we're really not seeing much of that done at for CBD. So like Arkansas, we have a license for processors, but I mean, they're not going to be going in there necessarily to measure, you know, uh, how safe and effective is this CBD oil that's being produced at this uh, given processor's location. Uh, there's been lots of fraud out there. Uh, you know, the, the quintessential CBD oil that you buy at gas stations, that's kind of been an issue. Uh, we've also, I, I've heard horror stories about some of the processors. Uh, talking to an inspector out of North Carolina, out of their health department, uh, he gave two examples. Like one of them was, so they could only go out and inspect if they got a complaint because <clears throat> it was not, CBD uses one complaint was a lady she was processing CBD oil in her kitchen and she had her pet house pigs running around her feet while she was doing it uh, another example that he gave was they had uh, a CBD processing operation being ran out of the back of a mortuary a funeral home so I mean that kind of stuff doesn't fill people with a lot of confidence so those kind of things are going to need to be addressed before uh, CBD usage can, you know, this can really take off. Uh, crop insurance, I'll cover this briefly and then I'll stop. I see I'm bumping up on my time. <clears throat> uh, RMA has crop insurance policies that are available. It's primarily being driven through the whole farm revenue policy. For you guys that are already doing organic production, you're probably going to be familiar with the, the whole farm revenue policy. Uh, you need crop, uh, crop history, <laughs> and that's kind of been tricky to, to get. Uh, but the real thing that's held us back on crop insurance is, first of all, there's no replant coverage, and that's been a big deal just because of the, the cost of putting in the crops. But you have to have a production contract with a processor that sets a price. And after 2019, after the fall out of the, the CBD market, a lot of processors are not wanting to guarantee price at all. So that's made crop insurance really difficult to, to get. So uh, the last thing I wanna to touch on is smokable hemp. <clears throat> because of all the problems with, uh, with processors, the lack of processors, processors declaring bankruptcy or processors just flat out uh, breaking their contracts, there's been a lot of interest in, well, why can't I just take my hemp buds directly to the farmer's market and I'll just sell them there. People can, can basically smoke them like they would marijuana and get their CBD that way. Some states are actually doing that. Uh, Arkansas, that is not an option. Uh, Arkansas, you actually have to have a license to transfer uh, the living plants, viable seeds, leaves, or floral material. So the only way you could sell that uh, that raw material to a, a, co a consumer is if they actually had a license themselves. So that's kind of limited here in Arkansas. Other states though, this has been a, a pretty viable approach. So with that being said, you know, guys have any questions, I'd happily take them. Do we have any questions for Rusty? Okay. I see one comment that said whole farm, I guess. Not Ar yeah. Arkansas. Yep, it's a, it's a pilot program this year. So it's, it's available in Kentucky. It's available in a few other states, uh, but it hasn't been available in Arkansas yet. Uh, and this is fairly typical with new uh, crop insurance products. RMA will kind of do a couple of test plots all around the country. And they're basically trying to figure out the actuarial table, like what their exposure could be if there's a bunch of losses. So this is one of those ones they're really going to want to measure six or seven times before they cut once on this one, because just because the costs are so high in this, they don't want to get uh, caught paying a whole bunch of money out for reinsurance. Okay. okay. With that, it is 11, 18, and if, anyone have any questions please put them in the chat box or get them to us but i'm trying to keep us on time and is lavelle is lavelle ready i don't hear from the lavelle okay well then we can take oh doc I'm, I'm here i didn't know i was supposed to be doing anything today <laughs> oh okay <laughs> okay okay well let's see you don't know 
do you have uh you have do you have a few comments you'd like to make about conservation generally anytime we do something on production we going to have a few uh comments about conservation so i think that's what you were on to do just a few comments about conservation on the trial but I, are you ready uh, uh yes i can i can make a few comments here okay um, okay well, with, with, with that we're going to go on to lavelle so lavelle yes um under the guidance of usda um, as long as you keep your crop or camp legally, you can participate in all USDA programs, uh, specifically the EQIP program. That is, all conservation practice acceptable for any other crop acceptable for hemp growing, whether that be an irrigation system, whether that be nutrient management, whether that be the mulch plastic, if you want to use that in growing your hemp, whether it be a grip irrigation system, any of those might apply for under any other type of crop grown can be utilized under the HEMP program through USDA and the EQIP program through NRCS. Um, the main thing is just what you've heard all the other uh, presenters state, you must make sure you are within the legal representation of the crop. Uh, other find the conservation practice uh, like I said, grip systems, what comes to mind, uh, some type of irrigation system, even high tones, if you want to get in and get a high tone, it is legal to get a high tone up under the NRCS program on the EQIP. And I'm, if I'm wrong here, maybe Alvin may, I think he's online, he may correct that. But those are the types of things that I think would be very important for the operation up under a hemp operation from a USDA and NRCS program. Uh, perspective time. Okay, and I, I assume the veil, but sensors, irrigation sensors, if you want to use that, I, I, I assume that may be covered also. Sure, I'm sorry. Yes, up under the, up under the program, up under irrigation water management, uh, you can get soil moisture sensors. Yes, by all means, it's one of those practices that you can get irrigate, uh, conservation assistance up under the equipment program, by all means. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Then. Well, thank you, Lavelle. And next time we'll make sure that we uh, that we notify you, you know, uh, ahead of time so that you would be ready. So we apologize for that mix up. Okay. Uh, now, uh, what I would like to do, if any of the speakers are still on, any of the, the four speakers that we have, if they are still on, I don't know if they are on or not, but uh, because sometimes you know, they have other things they need to do. But if you had some questions, I was thinking, especially for Dr. Lucas, some people may have had some questions for Dr. Lucas. We didn't have an opportunity to, uh, you know, to allow him to answer any questions. And there's Caleb back. But if you have any questions that you would like to ask any of the speakers, you may do that at this time. And for Dr. Lucas, I did have one. And this is something that I heard from a farmer, and I'm not exactly sure about this. But this farmer, were, this farmer was saying that they prune their plants. They prune their, you know, their, their, their hemp plants. And I would like to hear your comments on that. Well, um, there's a lot of different ideas on that. Uh, sometimes people prune, and, and this goes back to even um, illicit cannabis. People have been pruning it uh, for various purposes for a long time to, to try and change the growth morphology. And so the idea behind pruning, uh, you know, it depends on what they're doing, but sometimes people prune the top flower off to encourage a more bushy plant. Okay. And, then, uh, and then you, you know, if you have a more bushy plant, the idea is, is that you get more uh, <clears throat> flower surface area at the top of the plant. And so those top flowers are all the most potent. Um, which I don't know if this is how Caleb and uh, the guy, you know, Department of Agriculture in Arkansas do it, but, um, you know, in Kentucky, they're taking the top uh, five to six inches off of the plants that they sample in the field for uh, compliance testing. And so they're taking potentially the most potent potentially the highest THC containing sample of the plant. And so, you know, it'll be interesting going forward to see how uh, the government 
both federal and state level, but federal is the one that really controls it uh, with respect to, you know, what's, what's in the language of the farm bill. Uh, a lot of people are unhappy with that 0.3% THC threshold. And so it'll, it'll interesting to see how that evolves over the years legislatively. Uh, and that's really where it has to come from. The federal legislature has to change the language before the USDA will change uh, their interpretation of the language and how they apply it with respect to compliance. But that, you know, my point there is that that top flower is the hottest flower on the plant and that's what's getting tested right now. So uh, it really, I guess, again, it points to the risk for farmers growing this crop. I, I gave you more than your answer as far as pruning, didn't I? <laughs> I'm sorry. I get going. I get going sometimes. <laughs> no. I have one other question. There's some farmers, and I think some, some people say that it is better to uh, go with a seed rather than a, uh, a transplant. They say because of the seed, you develop a deeper tap root. Well, and I was wondering about your comments on that. So um, I've had a lot of interesting discussions with, with growers here in Kentucky. And, and um, working in the hemp industry, you become acquainted with people uh, – who have interesting past backgrounds, let's put it that way. And so I have, I have talked to people who were, uh, have been growing cannabis probably for 20 some years and they swear by uh, plants from seed uh, because if they're growing outdoors because they do develop a more robust root system. Now, whether they're transplants, you know, if you're growing from a seed in a greenhouse and you get that transplant in the field before it becomes root bound, in its container, uh, you're okay. But if you're growing from clones, those clones, again, are a plant that uh, has been dipped in a solution and, and, and the solution causes that stem to develop roots. And so the analogy that people often use is it's, it's like a, a grown up body with toddler legs. You know, uh, it, it, you know the, you've got this root system that's just kind of starting to spurt out on a plant that's already kind of developed up top. And so you don't get that really deep tap root. And actually the part where they snip the plant, uh, and my colleagues at University of Kentucky have looked into this a little bit, the part where they've snipped the plants uh, creates scar tissue at the bottom of the stem, but it doesn't always seal over perfectly. And so sometimes that allows uh, for uh, soil bound infections to, to get into those clones. Okay. So you know, there's two different schools of thought. Some people swear by clones because it cuts down on your labor. Uh, you don't have to go out and scout the field. You should still go out and scout the field. I've seen clones that have developed one branch, one branch with male flowers and the rest of the plants female. But that one branch with the male flowers will pollinate your field or pollinate a chunk of your field. Um, so it's a school of thought. You know, there are some people to swear by the growing from the seed and there are other people that say, you know, because of the reduced labor or the reduced uh, effort that they have to put into culling males, uh, clones is the way to go. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yep. So I'm looking in the... Okay, here's a question. It said, uh, Dr. Lucas, are any of your hemp producers using container farms? Are you familiar with green rum container farm i don't know that particular model uh or or practice but i know that some of our farmers here are definitely using containers uh, i've seen some modified tobacco floats where they're basically setting them up uh in containers on the tobacco floats and, and run their irrigation system uh you know micro drip into the containers uh and then the overflow is Echo float. So yeah, people are doing some real creative things with that. Uh, people are definitely using it, uh, but it's one of those areas where everybody who's into that has kind of got their own uh, elves. Okay. Uh, may I ask a question? Yes. Uh, hello, my name is Isaiah Hawkins, uh, graduating senior at Hampton University. And uh, I have curious uh, intentions behind uh, Kentucky because I wanted to know, do your program uh, practice hydroponics? Like is your facility uh, or hydroponic system? A research, uh, KSU, not in hydroponics specifically, but uh, where we've got a closed system 
with uh, fish uh, providing the nutrients uh, flowing through a, what's essentially a hydroponic bed, right? Um, and growing the hemp in that bed. So yeah, we've dabbled with it. Uh, I, I, it wasn't a particularly successful research experiment for various reasons, uh, but at some point I may revisit that. Yeah, uh, a lot of people, you know, certainly cannabis uh, indoor grows uh, use hydroponics. Um, you know, most of our hemp is grown outside, uh, and so I'm not, I'm not, I've not seen a whole lot of commercial hydroponic production here in Kentucky. All right, all right. That's that's good to know because um here uh so I go to Hemp University, which is in Virginia, and it's this store that I used to go to that's not too far from the university, and this guy got himself a license in um agriculture and hydroponics for his store because he he ran a hydroponics store. And he was just telling me about how like that is the new wave and how you can save energy and things of that nature. And I know you are an outdoor grower, so I'm pretty sure it doesn't really affect you. But for the ones who don't have as much acre available, they will have to like transfer into like indoor or things, of, you know, indoor hemp and stuff of that nature. So I just wanted to get like a, a background behind how it's spreading throughout the USA with hydroponics and things of that nature. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm, I, I work in hemp and I'm in a state where uh, the only legal cannabis is, is hemp. Uh, so, so I, I, I really, I, I'm not supposed to talk beyond hemp. I know certainly, uh, you know, other states where uh, recreational or adult use, whatever you want to call it, and medicinal cannabis is legal, uh, indoor grows are operating with a lot of hydroponic production for sure. Let me see. Here's a question. It said, are there specific guidelines for a storage facility? And I think that's for you, Caleb. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so that starts talking about um, some land use restrictions in the program. Uh, and that mostly gets into uh, can't be within a thousand church or school or a public area where children are present. Um, can't grow, process, handle, or store in a residential structure. Um, and all of that is covered in that PowerPoint I shared. I think that's the gist of it though. Um, and of course, if you're not the property owner of that site, you'll need um, a statement in writing from the owner they understand here. Okay, you sort of faded out the last, your last statement sort of faded out, Caleb, could you, re, uh, could you uh, repeat that last statement to you? Sure, sure. Um, so if the storage site is owned by someone else, the owner of that site will have to provide a statement in writing saying that um, this licensee is permitted to store hemp material at this site. Um, and that's all covered in land use restrictions uh, in the PowerPoint and in the program rules. Right. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, here's one I think for Rusty. They say, can a processor who has ended an agreement decide to leave product in the field after requiring the producer to buy seed from the processor? So this is an answer people really don't like, but it really depends on what's in your contract. Uh, <clears throat> the contracts have not been very favorable to the growers. Uh, and a lot of them had a hard time getting a hold of these contracts because the majority of them actually have confidentiality clauses in there. You're not supposed to show it to anybody else. Uh, a lot of them will have exclusions for, for the attorney if you want to have someone look at it, but there's not a lot of them out there. There's not a lot of good examples out there. Uh, you have to kind of know the industry. You can't just say, I've done a whole bunch of uh, soybean and rice contracts. I can do hemp. It doesn't work that way. <clears throat> so this has been one of those areas. I'm, I'm actually in the process of writing an article right now on hemp production contracts, the things that have been holding them back. And it's, it's really kind of been a perfect storm 
but it all comes down at the end of the day of what's in your contract. And if they've got something in there and out for them, you know, they don't have to, to purchase it. If they don't have the capacity that gets them out of it. And the other thing is, even if you have an ironclad contract, you know, bankruptcy court, the bankruptcy courts have a very wide discretion on uh, canceling contracts. <clears throat> so that's something they've seen in Kentucky is you might have an ironclad contract and, you know, if the bankruptcy court lets them go, then there's nothing much you can do about it. We saw an awful lot of that in Kentucky, Rusty, an awful lot. We got a lot of calls from Kentucky. <clears throat> okay. okay, here's another one. I spent thousands of transplants for the past two years, then later found that the processor got plants for less than half of what they sold them to me. The processor made money on selling plants and at harvest didn't want to buy back the product. Come in. Uh, I'll, I'll touch on that. Um, okay. This is just an example of um, what Rusty was just referring to, some of these issues with contracts with um, not only processors, even seed sources. Um, I've dealt with situations where a farmer spends uh, $20,000 on seed, doesn't necessarily do their homework, they don't get a stand, they don't get a germination, they just threw $20,000 in the wind and they didn't have any type of contract in place with their seed company. Um, so then they're calling us asking us what we can do for them. And the answer is not a whole lot uh, just because that's a business agreement between the grower and the seed source provider. Uh, same thing with the processor. And that's why um, I'm glad we're having the discussion about the contracts because it is important before you dive in head first into this industry. You really need to make sure you research the companies. I mean, some of these seed producers, they'll send you a contract, but if they're just a fly by night outfit that's from out of state, I mean, they'll send a bunch, sell a bunch of defective seed to a bunch of people, and then they close up shop, they'll move over to another state and create a new business with a new name and just rinse and repeat. Okay. Uh, Dr. Lucas, do you know of a good resource for learning about artificial hemp ready and processing the fiber hemp for textile purposes? Uh, I saw that in the chat and I, and I you know, I, I gave a, a brief answer okay. on that in the chat. You know, there are certainly other techniques out there. There's chemical reading. Um, you know, I, I, uh, I'm not as familiar with those techniques. Uh, I was particularly interested in the field reading just because uh, my, my main focus when I'm not talking about hemp is uh, soil quality. And so I was looking at the soil carbon input from redded hemp stalks, uh, which is why I really got into the field reading. Um, but, you know, yeah, those processes are certainly out there. Uh, but I am not as well versed uh, in those processes. I'm sorry, I can't give more information on it. Okay. I think that's the end of the questions. I don't see anything else in the chat box. Okay. I have a question. Go ahead. All right. This is for uh, Caleb and um, Rusty. So what are, as a uh, beginner who's stepping into the industry, what are some things I should look for in a contract that can potentially help me uh, grow healthy within the industry of hemp and cannabis? Um, I'll, I'll take that first. Um, so I think the number one most important thing you can do um, is just really, and this sounds so general, is just educate yourself. You know, every state does not handle hemp the same way. And growing, growing hemp in Colorado is not the same as growing hemp in Arkansas, which means even those types of transactions uh, are, look different from state to state. Uh, as of right now, you have every state dealing with a patchwork of different regulations of wrap your brain around not only federal and state laws, but the different requirements for each program. I mean, I think that right there sets you at a good leaping off point um, to move forward in the industry and any other uh, 
contracts or planning. Uh, it, it really comes down to homework and just networking, uh, figuring out what worked for some people and what didn't work for others. Rusty? So for the contracts, uh, <clears throat> before I signed a contract, one thing I would want to do is I would want to go tour that process. Are they actually in operation? Like, do they have equipment? Are they currently processing oil? Um, other things to look at in the contract is, are they telling you exactly what they want? Like, is there specific varieties? Or, I mean, how sophisticated are they? You know, back in 2017, 2018, I mean, these contracts are just basically whatever you grow, bring it in here and we'll squeeze it and get what we can out of it and we'll all make it just a, a boatload of money. It doesn't work like that now. So I, I want to see a processor that says, hey, this is, you know, this is the moisture percentage I want to see. I, uh, certification that there's no heavy metals in it. Like the more uh, restrictions that they're wanting to put on you for quality and things like that, I think it, it gives me a little bit better feeling that they're probably legit than someone that just, you know, oh yeah, grow hemp and time, we'll I'll test it and tell you how much I'll pay you. I mean, the, the specificity kind of, it helps. And then make sure you talk to other people in the area. They've had good relations. So that's worked. But if you have a major upheaval like you had in 2019, you know, and places are going out of business, I mean, billion dollar op that we're going under for that price drop in a year. So yeah, at the end of the perfect. I agree. The research on like, you know, the different licenses and the restrictions that come with certain licenses. There's a new license out here that was just given to uh, disproportionalized uh, workers and it's called the sexual social equity license, which help, you know, people who has been um, slapped with felonies behind the drug and people who are in a community where, you know, it's not so good for them to have it. So just knowing that, I just, I just really just want to know how to draw a straight line through the industry and where, you know, things like people getting finessed or people who are, you know, not getting the right work done. Like, I just want to stay away from those type of loopholes because like the industry is, is really, it's, it's simple. It's just, you know, you have a product that is for wellness and then you have it for people who want to use it for recreational. I just feel as though, like I said, I'm just trying to create a, a straight line through the industry and where I can understand the loopholes. Okay. Here's a question for Dr. Lucas. He said, what's the normal length or roots of hemp plants? How close should each plant be on each row? Uh, the row spacing, so within row spacing can vary uh, depending on the variety. Uh, you know, the root systems, the rule of thumb is that your root systems uh, are going to be as, as big around as the plant is above ground. Uh, you know, they, they can send, depending on the soil, they can send roots down pretty deep, um, you know, two, two and a half feet for sure. Uh, if it's a tap root, <clears throat> um, you know, again, it depends on variety. If you're, if you're working with some of the bigger varieties, you want to give you a little more space within the row. Again, like three and a half to five, six feet within row is what I see for CBD production. Um, certainly between row spacing depends a little bit more on the equipment you're using and usually anywhere from uh, six to eight feet between rows is what I'm seeing. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, but yeah, you know, again, if you're, if you're, if you're a, growing a crop that's got males and females in it, so you're starting from seed, you know, a lot of growers tend to start with a little smaller spacing because they know they're going to take about half their plants out. If they know they've got feminized seed or clones, uh, they give themselves a little wider spacing uh, to let those plants fill out. The thing to remember there is if you're going with the wider spacing, you're going to have more weeds. You're going to have to devote more time and to controlling what you're growing on plastic, which a lot of growers do do. Uh, I, I don't, at the end of the season in organic production anyway, you gotta take the plastic out of the field and that's a lot of uh, work. 
Okay. And this one is said, general question, how small can you start with CBDR? And I think Caleb, you Yeah, um, so for this requirement and the rules, um, it's really for outdoor growing sites. And there's a requirement for a quarter acre and a thousand plants. Um, so we don't really want to see teeny tiny plots. That would be a program rule violation. Um, so, but I do recommend starting small. Um, I've seen a lot, a lot of people bite off more than they can chew and it ultimately bit them in the butt. They, they just bit off more than they could chew and they didn't know what they were marching themselves into. So start small, don't plant more than you can afford to lose. Okay, thank you, thank you. I don't see any other other questions for the can I uh can I piggyback on that answer from yes, Caleb real quick? Yes, uh I will say <clears throat> that uh the people that seem to uh absorb the tribulations and trials of the market crash of 2019 and 2020 the ones that seem to do it the best had but had also uh processing facilities uh, where they could take that crop, could extract it. Most of those are doing small scale ethanol extraction, um, you know, but they, they've got their own in-house extraction. You know, we have, we have uh, producers here in Kentucky that uh, have been with the program since the beginning of it, um, going back to 2014, 2015, and they're, they're selling their product uh, that they grow in their field, extract it in their shed next door to their field or their barn, uh, and they sell it in the farmer's markets here in, in you know, Lexington, Louisville, uh, up in Cincinnati, you know. So, uh, you know, the smaller scale growers that had processing seem to do better. Well, I'll throw in a caveat on that. Right now, FDA has not gone out there and <clears throat> released uh, the regulations on how we're going to inspect so you need to have things like and then things that you would normally have to have for selling food products to the general public. You probably will have to. I mean, that's, but right now it's kind of been the wild west in their mind, but eventually they're going to. So yeah, that, that'll be additional processing costs that you'll, you may have to, <clears throat> if you go there. That's a real. Dr. English, I have a Go ahead, go ahead. Um, for anybody, if you can answer, I had a question about biochar. As anybody had experience with um, him, growing him with biochar, or um, is, is it possible because they walk on biochar with uh, sweet potatoes, but I was seeing if it was a possibility that him could uh, be grown with biochar. I'll go ahead and, and just tell you my experience on that. I mean, I've seen plenty of biochar products out there. Uh, personally, I've, I've not, you know, uh, used biochar as if I could make my soil more fertile through, you know, good crop rotations and, and cover crop use and, and, you know, things like manure amendments, that's the route I'm going to go. I, I, I'm not really, uh, my own personal preference is not towards biochar, but there are certainly lots of biochar products out there that uh, people catering to the hemp market have developed. Okay, because I've um, created biochar using chicken and cow manure. So it's, it's still organic. It's not just out of the bag. Sure. So it's just, I was seeing if it could, you know, be possible that it could grow. Because I think biochar makes uh, anything that you grow with it, um, I think two times more the soil. So I was kind of wondering. <laughs> I like biochar in a in a in a degraded soil where you might have already low organic matter. It helps get you a boost, uh, you know, and and make up some of that uh, make up some of that 
ground that you'd have to make up with good management, right? If you're starting out with a, a degraded soil. But yeah, I mean, certainly, again, lots of products are out there. Of course, you got to be careful with some of the products out there for the hemp market that are just trying to make somebody some money. And I don't know really how beneficial they are. Uh, but certainly there are lots of biochar products out there. Okay, I think she's finished with her question. Is there any other question? If not, I want to thank our panelists.